I'd like to call the meeting to order, please. We'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Sandra Gilliard. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Is Pastor Stiff here? Ms. Gilliard, you'll be praying as well. Now, Ronnie Dennis does good prayer, too. But go ahead, Mr. Do you mind? No, I don't mind. I, okay. I thought Ron was coming. I'm no, he... David, well, I can do it here. You do it right here. Okay. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we pause right now to say thank you. Before we ask you for anything, we want to give you thanks for what you've already done. God, we thank you for bringing us through another school year. God, for keeping our children safe and our teachers safe. God, and with all the things that are coming before us this afternoon, God, we pray for your divine guidance. God, that the decisions that we make, oh God, will be for the benefit of our children. God, that we would be fair and equitable in our dealings. And God, we just thank you for those that continue to give and support this great institution. Thank you for the leadership Bless their families and keep them, God, is our prayer. And watch our children and keep them safe over the summer. This we ask in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wonderful. It's really nice. Okay, we'll start with presentations. Our first presentation, Ms. Huff will give us an update um, on the industrial manufacturing program. For those of you who don't know, Renee Huff is our Director of Career and Technical Education. Good afternoon, Board. Good afternoon. Um, today we're going to have just an update on our advanced manufacturing program, and we're going to start with um, a short version of a su success in the new economy, a um, video. Education is core to our economy, but in order to guide our educational systems and maximize future income, we must understand the misalignment between education and our workforce. In my pursuit of higher education, I have earned two bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, and am working on a PhD. In total, this has cost me over $150,000. I've done all this because I believe formal education is important. Part of this belief came from seeing charts like this, presenting a correlation between higher degrees and higher income, showing on average that a person with a college degree earns far more money than the average person without a high school diploma. This perceived higher earnings for having a four-year degree has fueled a college for all philosophy, causing educators and parents to encourage going to the university, any university, to major in anything in pursuit of future job security, social mobility, and financial prosperity. This philosophy has increased college enrollment, resulting in 66% of high school graduates in this country enrolling in higher education right after high school. That's two out of three. Initially, they are deemed the successful ones. But what you won't see advertised is the reality that most drop out, and only a quarter of those that enroll will finish a bachelor's degree. Only after these few graduate do many of them start exploring careers. It is here that they discover that their degree may not have prepared them for the world of work. You may be well educated, but not every degree is direct preparation for employment. This misalignment between degrees and job skills causes half of university graduates to be underemployed in what are called gray-collar jobs, taking positions that do not require the education they have received at a cost that is more than they can afford. Conventional wisdom suggests that a university degree guarantees a higher salary. But with rising education costs, a shrinking job market, and the oversaturation of some academic majors in the workforce, this old advice is now a myth for a majority of students. The economy and the world have dramatically changed. Over the last three generations, we've gone from 13% of the population stepping into a college classroom to 60% attending some form of higher education. In 1960, when taking into account all jobs in the American economy, 20% required a four-year degree or higher, 20% were technical jobs requiring skilled training, and 60% were classified as unskilled. 
But what's the right percentage to meet the labor market demand for tomorrow? In 2018, Harvard University predicts only 33% of all jobs will require a four-year degree or more, while the overwhelming majority will be middle-skilled jobs requiring technical skills and training at the credential or associate degree level. A four-year degree may have many benefits, but think about the people you know who, from an economic perspective, inefficiently spent time and money to get a degree that perhaps they didn't really need for the career they are in. The true ratio of jobs in our economy is one, two, seven. For every occupation that requires a master's degree or more, two professional jobs require a university degree, and there are over half a dozen jobs requiring a one-year certificate or two-year degree. And each of these technicians are in very high-skilled areas that are in great demand. This ratio is fundamental to all industries. It was the same in 1950, the same in 1990, and will be the same in 2030. The hope for encouraging university education is that as the number of university-trained workers increases, the demand for their services in the workplace will increase as well. Unfortunately, this is not so. The whole pie may get bigger as the labor force and the economy grows, but the ratio will not change. The reality is, there will not be more professional jobs available within the labor market. And some professional jobs have been replaced by technology or are being outsourced. Well-intentioned attempts to send more and more students straight to the university will not change the types of jobs that dominate our economy, nor will a college for all mentality mask these labor market realities. The college for all rhetoric that has been so much a part of the current education reform movement is often interpreted as university for all. This message needs to be significantly broadened to a post high school credential for all. Students at various educational levels have left school without employable skills, setting up our children for failure, costing them and taxpayers millions. All while the labor market is desperate for highly trained, skilled technicians. So how do you position yourself for high-wage, in-demand jobs? Let's say you were considering a career as either an electrician or a business manager. You would find that the average annual income for electricians is 51000 only about half of the 105000 average wage for management occupations. So at first glance, it looks as if getting a bachelor's degree in business is a no-brainer. But adding skills and ability into the picture adds a whole new dynamic. What if you have the potential to become an excellent electrician? but lack the skills and ability to be an excellent manager. Then you should be looking at projected incomes towards the bottom of the pay scale for managers and towards the top for electricians. You would then discover that electricians near the top of the pay scale make around 86,000, far higher than the income of a manager near the bottom of the pay scale at 52,000. Now this is just one example, but the concept is true throughout all industries. The claim that you will make more money with an increased amount of education is not necessarily inaccurate, it's just incomplete. That advice is based just on the averages, but no one is perfectly average. Everyone has unique skills, talents, and interests. In fact, the income for the top individuals in a wide variety of skilled jobs that require an industry credential or two-year degree is far higher than the average income for many occupations that require a four-year degree. Nationally, associate degree earners range between 27,000 and 68,000, while bachelor's recipients earn between 34,000 and 97,000. But this data only accounts for the 25th to the 75th percentile of full-time adult workers. This means that 25% of associate degree holders earn more than 68,000 annually, and 25% of bachelor's degree holders earn less than 34,000. Our world has changed, and in this new economy, the university degree is no longer the guaranteed path towards financial success as it was for previous generations. And even if you do earn one, that education alone may not be enough. In today's highly technical, knowledge-based economy, having hands-on skills and perfecting what you're good at can be more valuable than getting a degree in something simply to get one. Employers want to know what you can do and what you can do well, not just what degree hangs on your wall. Since new and emerging occupations in every industry now require a combination of academic knowledge and technical ability, we need to ensure that we're also guiding students towards careers and not just to the university. So before enrolling in classes or deciding what you're going to do next in your life, step one is self-exploration. In addition to your interests, really analyze your talents and strengths. Step two is career exploration. Understand the jobs available, the income ranges they pay, 
and evaluate the skills they require. Identifying an area that appeals to your interests, skills, and the labor market may be your first career. And then you can develop a tentative career plan, complete with multiple training and education options. The key is to align your interests and abilities with your first career choice and the education and training you'll need to receive. This alignment will help bring your future into focus and ensure your position at the top of the pay scale in your chosen career. What all this data shows is that success in the new economy is as much about acquiring the knowledge, skills, and abilities needed for in-demand occupations as it is to be well-educated. Both paths may work for you, but education combined with technical training is how you ultimately secure a competitive advantage in the new economy. Community colleges are in the ideal position to provide over 70% of tomorrow's workforce with an education combined with applied technical skills, industry-driven credentials, and specific preparation for employment. Being a skilled craftsman or technician is highly valued. Investments in career education programs in high schools and community colleges will help all students obtain an education which includes technical training and preparation for the workplace. Ultimately, this is how all students can be successful. In the new economy, both education and technical skills are the new currency. Will you be ready? This is just a little bit of information to help us to lead into our career and technical education programs. And with um, <clears throat> that being said, with our new program, Advanced Manufacturing Technology, I have given you the front, um, the front page of what our curriculum frameworks is going to look like. And on the second page of that, you will see the program sequence when you flip it over on the on the on the curriculum framework yeah and on the back side you'll see the program sequence so for next year we're looking at starting advanced manufacturing technology one and to be offered at all three schools all three high schools palatka interlarkin and crescent city and our numbers are growing and so right now at interlarkin we have 35 and Crescent City we have 25 and Palatka High School we have 18 and that number is growing because they're continuing to work on those students. Um, we had a little change in curriculum with our curriculum frameworks. We were originally going to work with industrial manufacturing technology and maintenance and repair and with the new um, economy and with what our business partners and we have today in um, Georgia Pacific is with us today um, and Seminole um, Mr. Knutson is here from from Georgia Pacific right um, they asked us to take a look at the advanced manufacturing technology frameworks it was a new framework last year when we started talking about this but it had not been adopted so now we have adopted this, it's been adopted and we have chosen to use this one next year. It has given us a little bit of um, setback with trying to find a teacher, but I do have that allocation and we are going to be able to post for that position, but the credentialing of that particular teacher is a little different than what it was with the industrial manufacturing. So you need three teachers, one at each school? Um, no, ma'am. No? What, what we are hoping is that one teacher would be able to teach at Palatka High School in Crescent City and the teacher that we hire at Interlochen High School for welding would be able to start one year of the Advanced Manufacturing Technology one and then we would take those students from there and then we would see what we could do with either getting another teacher at Interlochen or you know bringing them into Palatka High School for instance. Okay, but right now we're, we're looking at two. I mean, one teacher for in advanced manufacturing, campuses. and then one, for I the first. This is just for the first year. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
So in with that, we'll have like safety, just like with like welding yeah. one. Okay. Um, so we with that change of the teacher credentialing, it you know it's made it a little bit more difficult. But we do we will find those sort of you know those yeah. certifications. Um, and just like in this video, you know, we in the district with our career ed, with our career specialists and outreach recruitment specialists, you know, we're looking at clear career exploration and working with these different things within our students from middle school to high school and using career shines and in hopes that students would know what's happening with manufacturing, industrial <clears throat> manufacturing type programs and any of our career ed programs. We're actually starting at the elementary level next year with our magnet school mm -hmm. to start that awareness too. So yes. It's a K-12 initiative. Okay. Right. And um, the last page is the actual industry certification that our students will come out with. It's called Certified Production Technician. And they take um, four exams, as you see on the back side of this, and each year and then they'll take an exam and then they'll be a certified production technician which would allow them to go into a particular career um, whether it be at georgia pacific or seminole or any industrial um, employer that needs these particular skills that this particular program will allow our students to have it's exciting to be able to walk in and mm -hmm. yeah put it on the exciting. desk and get the job yeah that's good okay. Awesome. So looking at the um, curriculum, their senior year, they would do advanced tech four and their capstone project. How's yes, ma'am. Five. Well, if we do, we're targeting sophomores right now for advanced one. Okay. Okay. So in their junior year, they would do two and three. Oh, like a block. Yes, ma'am. Okay so that they would have that time to get in the shop right. and also work with their um, power tools as well as the production automation and the production and the robotics and everything that goes along with this particular curriculum frameworks so for the skills and these needed. are sophomores you said <clears throat> yes ma'am for advanced one okay we're starting and we're going to put some juniors in there that are interested yeah so equipment wise what are we going to need to do um, <clears throat> with this company that had that you see here with the Amatrol, um, we have I have met with Mr. Yeager, a representative of Amatrol, and he has given us a four-year quote. So in the first two years, the first year it's about eighty thousand dollars for that particular equipment <clears throat> that would help us get our students the necessary skills to you know for this curriculum. It's a curriculum. Um, as well as all types of um, software as well as the the machines and the different tools and things for them to be able to um, <coughs> how to per do site or total okay you got mine that's per site 80,000 per site mm -hmm. that was for year one and two together so 40,000 per site per year no, no. ma'am 80,000 80, for two. year one and two if we were to able to buy year one and two is what we were yeah. looking at then it's like eighty thousand dollars some of this equipment is portable that if we used one teacher from Palaka say for instance and then it, they would be able to travel <coughs> with those particular um, units and it's being financed through a grant the district um we have some grant funds <coughs> we have some donation you know um business partner funds we have grants we have written some grants that would help us to be able to um burnish this equipment awesome okay so and there's room at both schools um at palatka high school are you using where carpentry was yes ma'am okay and crescent city has Yes, ma'am. Ample space as mm -hmm. well. And so does interlocking. Interlocking as yes, well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Awesome. Changing with the times. Mm -hmm. In the first year, what is our expected enrollment for these classes? I have. There's um, 35 right now at Interlarkin, 25 at Crescent City, and 18 at Palatka High School. So that would be which could increase before the summer. Yes. Season. I okay. mean, they're still working on scheduling. Yeah. This is just what they've given me in the last week. Okay. So and they're our still goal working is to have. That. A teacher that teaches six periods a day no it's not really possible if they're going back and forth correct so our goal is to have 
How many classes at each school? One class at each school as advanced manufacturing one right now. And then if we're utilizing the so teacher, okay, for that instance, that allows the okay. travel time. if the teacher at Interlarkin that we're going to hire for welding, he has the credentials to possibly teach advanced manufacturing one. We have a hundred students that are interested in welding. So he would have a full day. Right. His oh, welding yeah. students mm -hmm. as well as an advanced manufacturing one for the first year. At Palatka High School, we would have one advanced manufacturing one travel time for that teacher to go to Crescent City, for instance, to be able to teach at Crescent City. We're doing that so we don't have to bus the Crescent City. Right. Right. Yes. Right. But I guess yes. it would be a part-time position for that one. I mean, it's not going to take all day to get to Crescent City. Well, it also depends because that particular person may also be able to teach something else. Something else. Yes. And so will the two schools share the cost of that teacher or is that teacher taken care of out of your budget? Yes, I mean, ma'am. That okay. teacher is taken care of out of the career ed department. Awesome. I guess my question is with, with that many students, if we're only right now going to have one class at each school, one that has, you already said 35 kids signed up, so 35 kids in one class. As it stands right now. but. Yeah. Career ed doesn't have, you know. Yeah, the if, vocational classes are, I'm sorry, career but, but, ed. Right, but career ed doesn't have a cap. A cap like but in the very classes. first one, depending on safety and those kinds of things, that 35 might not be, you know, it might, yeah, it might not be conducive to have 35 in a class. But then again, some may want to come out. But right now, that's what we have that have requested but they can't i mean you can increase the number of classes right yes ma'am yeah, yeah. That's i mean that's grows. the goal that's right i mean the first year first year is one and then next year we hope <coughs> to add more but if we had two 40 because students it'll be one and two yes ma'am right new group and well we would like for it to be advanced one and then two and three blocked yeah, yeah. yes I mean, it's just a huge investment for one school to say $80,000 for one school, and we have 20 kids that are investing. When you look at the numbers, that's a lot of money. My goal was, hey, if we have $80,000 worth of equipment and curriculum, why are we not filling the classes with 60 or 80 kids? Okay, our projection was 25 per school for, for the, the first, first year. year. Right. So take it. exactly. Well, that's what I said. What are the hopes? Have we recruited them? Have the guidance even offered them? That I was just looking. We for put them on. We put them on school buses and yes. took them. Yes, and to we DP. took them to yeah. Georgia Pacific. Yeah. So we have met with them. Right. The guidance counselors have met with them. These are the ones that have shown that interest. Palaka High School is still going through that list, and they're looking at what their first choice was and their second choice and was. And their alternates and their calling kids. Exactly. I, I, yeah. You're I mean, gonna, and they are. And you're going to so, fill them up. Yes, sir. I, I, well, I'm, one class, yeah, that's 25 kids. I'm saying, why aren't we filling six periods of it? That's all I'm asking. Why is that not a goal? Because we don't have the teacher allocation for all that. No. Well, we have an allocation Damn. that I mean, we could do, but, you know, at Interlarkin, for at instance, schools. if we're able to use the teacher for welding, right. He has a hundred students. They have a hundred students already requesting welding one. Right. So he would have that would fill up his day, and then the other ones we would work on. Gotcha. But we're also looking at the other possibility of that teacher, at, yeah, for the advanced manufacturing to be able to teach, possibly another class. Well, and is it a semester or a year long? It's a year long, a year -long class. Long. And it's just and like any other new <coughs> program we've started. It's got to start for it somewhere. To grow. Oh, and, I think it will. You know, grow. And you add to it yeah. each year. And, right. And the more and the more we're going to be um, starting in introduction to manufacturing at Jenkins Middle School, that's a feeder. So they're going to be able to take um, a semester class in industrial manufacturing, introduction to those manufacturing right. careers. Which I agree. I guess I just wondered why was the goal only one class when I know that these kids would be, you know. Because of the busing issue that we were, the transportation that we had originally talked about. Okay. We were going to use it at one school. Okay. So the students were going to be bused gotcha. in from Interlochen and from Crescent City. But now that that's changed and we have three sites. Yes. That so hopefully it'll grow. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Well, and, and it looks like your your well, I mean, welding teach at Interlochen High. Students if if the numbers were to expand. Because he is uh, the one that's doing it, he could offer possibly two peers if it had to be because he has, you know, he's yes. the one doing the welding and that. 
So, so it, it won't. Yes, ma'am. It, 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 you know, it will grow. Yeah, I, I guess that's just. But this is just what we're working with with requests and, you know, and what the counselors have been working with with their list of the students that did go to our on our tour. Mm. And, you know, as these kids of the next two to three years start getting jobs, you know, I think we've talked about See the number that. of jobs that are available at GP and other places. It's going to grow yes. tremendously by that time because they'll see it's, it's, you know, they can get a job with it. And that's what our goal is. And, and as and um, Mr. Hathaway in our meetings, students that just come out of high school, it's no longer I'm going to go work where my dad worked you've got to have these skills to even get in on the lower level jobs that are out there and you've got to know how to go in and apply for these jobs and have that skill to be able to work the technology when we were out there it was amazing at the teamwork that the students were able to see that day and we've not been able to tour in 10 years so just to see the, you know the students being able to see that they have to have that particular skill of working together. Yes. Go pull. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Thank you, Ms. Hubb. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Renee. Next, we have an overview of the Farm Workers Career Development Program Audit. Who's who will be doing that? Lucy. So she was here a minute ago. I thought it would be Lucy. Yeah, Lucy was. Uh, Lucy Broski. No. Oh. Lucy. Oh. Lucy, oh, well, I guess <laughs> Deborah. Yeah. I will. Did they not know that? Yeah, they're coming up. She was going to introduce them. Oh. I'm sorry, I thought they were just going to take over. <laughs> I, and I count on that, Lucy. I count on that. Um, the ladies came today to tell you about a recent audit that they had with their Farm Workers Career Development Program, the grant was audited in the early late winter early spring march mm -hmm. and they had outstanding results from that and so i asked them to come today and we have lucy or lucia sanchez Valdivia. Valdivia. i always <laughs> leave all that in. See, there's too much i can't do all that and of course linda osborne so ladies tell them about how wonderful you did <laughs> I'm going to give the floor to Lucy since I retired and I'm now her assistant. So, <laughs> she so you was, didn't really retire. Yeah, I didn't really retire, but I just sort of switched positions. So I'll let Lucy be the one since she was the really the one that was overseeing the audit. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's Buenas a pleasure tardes. to be here. When I started this, I don't leave Crescent City that often. <laughs> so. So it was a nice drive here. But um, we had the Farm Worker Career Development Program since 1998. And um, I was so pleased to hear uh, Renee's presentation on career and technical education, because that's basically what we have been doing with our uh, students after they graduate from high school. Uh, we, um, and even some of our dropouts, we uh, do a one-on-one -on -one, um, uh, one on one work with our with our participants and if they are farm workers and meet the criteria we uh, this program uh, ch funnels them into vocational careers and certifications and we have lots of success stories um, the we're here to talk about the audit but the audit is just part uh, we have to make sure that everything is done correctly when they come to check so we can continue this great program but it is, it is a very successful pro program we serve about 48 participants every year um, every single year the audit has been exemplary and that is in part because of the great team that we have they couldn't talk enough about uh, where is Kim is not here no, Kim's not. Kim is not here but they were so impressed with our uh, finance department they said it is the best they have seen statewide so everybody should yeah. give Kim a shout out um, okay. and, and the whole uh, finance department mm. but oh. basically um, that is what we do did I leave anything out Miss Linda Andale, Andale, really. that Kim man Kim oh and, and we recently uh, uh, we recently also started a partnership with uh, with the register apprenticeships of uh, Florida and um, because I serve on the career source board and um, the guy was sitting next to me so we started talking about it he came to our center and actually told our students how to apply 
to the apprentice program and they were having this fair. We went on a Saturday morning, we took a van and we took our students there. And we finally, I am here to report that we have our first apprentice. Wonderful. He received the official call um, last week, I think. Um, they told me first, so I was like, oh my God, we have it, but you can't tell him. <laughs> <laughs> he, has to, he has to receive the official letter. So we have, we have an official apprentice uh, finally, and we have more in the pipeline. So that is something that we're working on. It is very exciting to be working in, in this field. So uh, Lucy, and are these students from Crescent City High? Uh, you at most the middle of school are. most oh, of them are we serve a region so we serve most uh, mostly Crescent City Palatka people but because we're in the region we're also serving some of Volusia, uh, Volusia County residents mm -hmm. what will the apprenticeship be in he's going to be in the sheet metal wonderful yes Good. he's very excited I bet. I bet. <laughs> I'm more excited than he is <laughs> <laughs> so do you guys have any questions just to we just appreciate yeah, all that you do. do. Only Linda, Linda's always done. Just yes, Linda's great. Only question, <laughs> on, only question I had was yes, sir. on this uh, farming. On the invitation? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, oh. I brought an invitation, and I put it out there. Mm -hmm. um, if you can't read it, just flip it over, Mr. I was just Buckles. curious. It was talking, <laughs> it was talking about... Uh, Oh. Got food and they're picking fern. So yes. I, I, can you eat fern and salad? You probably can. Okay. I was just, <laughs> I was just curious. I see things like that. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, no, we have a celebration. Uh, we also have a binational uh, teacher exchange program. We have a teacher from Mexico working with our students and families. And everybody's more than invited to Crescent City at 6 o'clock on July 25th at the Miller Middle Auditorium. Um, we expect to see everybody there. It's a great mm -hmm. display of um, tradition, cultural heritage, and also what our students and parents do. I think is the only show in town where you see parental involvement because be our career. parents are the uh, performers Thanks. as well as the students. Okay. Lucy, how many times have you been a national award-winning migrant? I have to always correct you, Mr. Buckles. We're internationally <laughs> awarded. <laughs> yes, Linda and I both hold the highest award given by the Mexican government. Uh, we hold the Otley. And nationally, I think Ms. Linda is twice national, yes. nationally. Yes. And me, I think only once um, because I'm following in her footsteps. I have to. <laughs> I'm behind. That's pretty good to know that we have international stars here. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, right, today you. we have the Mexican consulate back home, so I had to leave them working while I came here. Okay. So, um, and, and thank you for all the support. We couldn't do all of this without the support um, to the migrant program throughout the, whole, the years. Okay. Thank you, well, you, have Thank always, you, so you have always been a great supporter. I will be there because you told me I had to. <laughs> That's all I expect. <laughs> so all you have to do is tell me has to. She does. Oh. Yeah. She got more pull than you got. Well, Miss Deborah Buckles helps me sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so any more questions? No. no? Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Congratulations. By the way, you're talking about farming. We just received a farm to school grant. Uh, in the last few days where I believe we'll hire an individual that will help uh, be a lia liaison between our local farms and our That's school right. cafeterias. So we, we'll be wonderful. eating our own food grown in Putnam County. Local, yeah. local grown. Right. Yeah. Huh. Okay, we're going to change things up a little bit. Um, we're going to move um, Bennett Cooper. The, the, the discussion, it's more like a presentation discussion on the um, naming of the football field at Veterans Memorial Station, the stadium. <laughs> so Ronnie Dennis and your cohorts, would y'all come up now? Wake him up, Linda. There you go. What you asked for. You wanted, you didn't oh, want to I stay the whole time. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I see on the agenda where it's on the agenda for approval. Do you want me to do that whole presentation again? You do. Okay. And by the way, when we started this thing out, and for those of you who have already heard this, uh, bear with me. I'll do it as quickly as possible. We indicated that this was not about wins and losses. And if I could, I have a letter here from the winningest coach in the history of Palatka High School. And that would be Jim McCool. Would you pass that around? There's two pages. Yeah. You can pass that around. If you can read, you can read that. And uh, he wanted to make sure that the, the message got across that it wasn't about wins and losses. It was right. about 
character, it was about commitment to young people, it was about commitment to a cause. And as I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, it, uh, the, the two men came together in a very difficult time in our community and simply made a very difficult situation a lot more palatable, a lot more workable, and certainly the character that the two men had war not war all phone but uh, was certainly seen by the young men that participated in their programs one of the things that of course uh, veterans memorial stadium will remain veterans memorial stadium forever and uh, and that is as it should be but uh, when two men who have, have done as much as coach bennett and coach cooper have and certainly there, uh, certainly there's something that we need to do i think and naming the field, and I, I just really think that uh, Bennett Cooper Field at Veterans Memorial Stadium not only has a nice ring, but when people see that, and a lot of our fans, you know, are people who have gone to games even back when Coach Bennett and Coach Cooper were coaching. When they see that, it'll bring back a lot of memories for them. And uh, I think that, and again, we could have, as could have two weeks ago and could have again tonight if we needed to, uh, fill the place up with people who are all for this. And uh, certainly, uh, Again, if it was about wins and losses, that letter that you have there from Jim McCool indicates that he is 100% behind it. He being the winningest coach in the history of, my goodness, has it been 40 years since that school opened? He was successful because of me. Sandra, because of Sandra, Jim was very successful. Yes, uh, yes, 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 he was. She was calling all those JV games. <laughs> I remember listening to that. Uh, but anyhow, guys, I'd appreciate it if uh, you could, would consider that and uh, – and uh, I will, if it's okay with you, I will send you some information on signage and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. One thing that's really depressing about that field, the, the stadium, is that it's Veterans Memorial Stadium, but the only thing there that indicates it is a little concrete monument right. mm -hmm. just inside the main gate. Yeah. Otherwise, and I mean, you can't even get to it because it's inside of a <coughs> fence, I think. Right. right. And uh, so something along the lines of signage, sh should you approve this, needs to be done. And I'd be more than happy to volunteer to take care of getting that process going mm -hmm. with the uh, sign designer of your choice. <clears throat> Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the request to name the football field at Veterans Memorial Stadium the Bennett Cooper Field. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. So Thank you. Well, we're going to do, if it's okay with the board, we'd like to, the first home game, first have a presentation, game. and you said you would take care of getting Mr. Cooper's family there. Yes, I'll, I'll get Gail Wonderful. and her girls. Okay. Um, yes. I can't wait till football season starts. I'm ready. Yeah, we'll Thank you for coming, Ron. Thanks, Thanks to your group. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for public comment, and we have quite a few. Let me remind everyone who plans on speaking that you have a three minute time limit in which to speak. I will ask the board secretary to please um, post the time that you can see. When you come up to the podium, please address the board. Tell us your name and address. First, we have Lisa Parsons. Thank you so much, Board. Uh, Lisa Parsons, 1113 Lee Street, Palatka, Florida. And um, I just want to thank the, the entire board that was here earlier. And Ms. Jorgensen has also showed her support um, over, the, over the years for small environments. And that's just what I wanted to, to thank you for, for giving us the opportunity to continue with that. Um, and working very closely with us with your leadership team, we could not do it without putting putting good minds together. And let me tell you, sitting there discussing and just brainstorming together the options that are available, it's taking everyone's passions and backgrounds. And those, and those of you who are just saying, we got to keep kids first, or constantly reminding us of that. Um, and who's sitting out here in the background looking up statute? One of my staff members who all... And she's looking up dropout prevention and academic interventions. And there are, in statute, a gazillion opportunities. It's, it's, <laughs> it's countless. And I just wanted to read to you real quick um, 
district school board seeking to enter into a partnership with private entity or a public entity to operate a second chance school for blah 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 and the list goes on and on and on you can select all through that there right? there is there's money here available for that as well so there i'm just i'm asking you guys to to with your with your leadership team for us to get together and dig into these statutes and and there's money available for that our, our edge board in in the four years we've had so many board members come and go and you're left with right now three members and one of those due to to rotate off of the board the stability of that board should not the ki the kids in their environment should not depend on the stability of that board so I just want, want to challenge you um, to, to just really really continue to work together with us we have, um, and I, I would like um, those other, my edge people who have decided to, to, to come and speak today, I want you to come on up and, and be here so you don't waste any time getting here. But um, come on, Luke, did you sign a card too? Um, there, there is so much available and we have extend, extended um, invitation after invitation. People are scared to try something new. And yet the traditional model does not work for all students. Um, we discussed earlier that, that we had a dual enrollment cost of over $13,000 this year, plus books. So we have kids uh, that are up here at the top excelling with that. And we have dual, um, our career tech programs in, in not just the health care, but CNA program that needs to move forward in a relationship with St. John's River State in their workforce program. We need to continue to build those workforce programs and those connections in dual enrollment as well. But our, but our people that, that have good minds and, and have the tools to work together, I'm just, I'm just begging you to, to continue to, to sort through options and, um, and not give up on uh, the small environment because these, these people, like, like Luke and, and so many others that have just absolutely thrived there, I just uh, I th appreciate the extra chance. I, th I, I think there would be a lot of financial opportunities there, and that's why I mentioned it earlier in the meeting. But you guys continue to look and get with instructional staff okay thank you thank you uh, next is Stephen Dodge Board members my name is Stephen Dodge I live at 118 Hibiscus Street in Palatka and uh, I've got a student my son is a student at Edge he uh, had gotten into some trouble about three years ago and as a result he was not allowed to go to the high school and none of the other high schools in our area would allow them to come in. I found out about Edge High School through Mrs. Deal. And I went down there and spoke with, with Ms. Parsons. And uh, she had Devin come in. She talked with him. And she said that she would welcome him to the, into the school. And I will tell you in the three years, and um, Ms. Parsons will go along with it, that he's tested her a few times. And I've had to go down. But... I have to say that he went from, he's a student athlete, and he had gone from just getting enough grades so he could play to, I forget if it was the first or second marking period last year, he came home and handed me his report card because he had five A's and a B. Oh, great. And I said, you're pretty proud of that? And he was like, yeah, it's all right. And I said, baloney, you feel good about yourself, don't you? And I've seen such a change in him. He's grown up. He, you know, he realized he made a mistake, but he was given an opportunity, and I really believe that we need Edge High School. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Dodge. Next, we have uh, Luke Lee. Hello, board. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Hello, board. Thank you for having me. My name is Luke Lee. Address is 3316 Ross Circle. Um, I am a student that attends Putnam Edge High School, and... I'm aware it's a financial situation going on, and, and I know that money doesn't just, you know, grow on trees, and, you know, I know, you know, the students saying they love the school doesn't really help anything, but, you know, before I got to EDGE, I really didn't have confidence in my academic skills. I really didn't think I was smart, or I didn't think I could excel in any school or academic, you know, anything like that, and these teachers they just take the time and they're so passionate with with working with you and they believe in you and they surround you with just you know love and they don't give up on you no matter how long it takes they don't give up on you and I found myself at this school and I feel like I can go anywhere and take that anywhere now like I have tools that will help me be successful and help me become somebody 
And, you know, I just really encourage you to pursue options to, to keep this school going. And I just imagine all the other students that this, that this school could help you know, and people that don't do well in bigger environments and, and a lot of people, it could really help them. And, you know, I've also learned to accept all kinds of people. It, it's like a fan. It's almost like a family at this school. You're exposed to so many different types of people and you get to know them and it just teaches you to just be kind to everybody. So, I mean, this school is just it changed my life pretty much just on how I see things and, and how I feel about myself and and I'm just so grateful for this school, and I hope that it can be things explored to help keep it open and help other people. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Miss Elizabeth Parker. Luke's grandma. Yeah. I'm Luke's <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> My name is Elizabeth Parker. My name is Elizabeth Parker, and I live at 3316 Raw Circle. I have eight other grandchildren that are in the school system and do very well. However, Luke is not one of them. And <laughs> since he has it's been now, at the edge, now, yeah. he, he has excelled. Like Ms. Parsons always says, tools in our toolbox. Luke's full of tools. And he's going now. He's making straight A's. Um, did you make a B this last time? But other than that, he made straight A's for two years. That's wonderful. You don't know how thrilled we are to see that. I can't thank Lisa and the staff enough. The, the, they care so much. They work with them. Luke is a very hard worker. He works very hard. He stays for tutoring two days a week. And Mr. Poole is usually there with him those two days. But he has other teachers that do stay and help him if he needs you know, help. So I just hope that some way you can find a way to keep it open, not only for Luke, but for the other students out there who have the same problems or similar problems and need this environment in order to succeed. So hopefully it will be open this next year. Luke will graduate and then he will go to St. John's and get his two-year degree and then go wherever else he wants to go. I think the University of Florida. But that, that's what I'm real supportive of Lisa and all that Lisa's done and the staff that she has gotten. And, oh. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. And next, Keith Smith. Uh, hello, board. My name is Keith Smith. My Palatka address is 951 Mosley Avenue. Um, now, I want to first thank the school board members who attended the uh, Putnam Edge board meeting last week uh, your presence was very much appreciated and I've just gotten to know Putnam Edge being new to the area and it's a really special place uh, with the values of trust respect and responsibility I'm pretty credentialed I can go anywhere I want to go Putnam Edge is where I want to be um, to follow up on an earlier presentation in terms of the focus of career tech and uh, where that's where most of the jobs and the careers are today, uh, those things are already in place and functioning at Putnam Edge with the Microsoft Certification Program, the HHA, the Home Health Aid Program, the, C the LPN Program, and the coming CNA Program. Also in the pipeline are uh, the programs for a 911 operator and criminal justice. So the program the career technical education programs uh, that you say is ne are necessary are already in place and functioning at Putnam Edge okay and it'd be a good thing in order to if other students could be able to take advantage of that in the future uh, and once again I thank you for your work your efforts and your support thank, thank you. you thank you, thank you. Mr. Smith. okay uh, the next public comment card was filled out by Mr. G.G. Galloway. He's here representing um, Benchmark Properties. And I don't know if you have anything you want to say. Need, uh, if if y'all need comments on, on. So when we discuss later, that I'll later. Put, I'll postpone my, if you need. Okay, thank you. And then next and last is Vito Russo.
Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Hello. I hope you're all well. Uh, my name is Vito Russo, and I live at 415 uh, Emmett Street in Placa, Florida. Uh, so I'll get right to it. Uh, this is in regards to the Campbell Building. Uh, so I'm not necessarily opposed to repurposing the Campbell Building to uh, into a training facility for billing synergy billing. Uh, I am absolutely opposed to selling of the building at a fraction of its appraised value. Uh, the offer, according to the newspaper, was three and, three and a quarter for a one million dollar building. Uh, the taxpayers own this building, and from the letters. To the Placa Daily News, I think it's very clear that uh, they do not want the building sold at some giveaway price. Now, personally, I believe the Campbell Building should be should hold the Cambridge program because having the best school in the county in uh, in our neighborhood would have a very strong revitalization effect. Uh, Placa is a severely blighted community. And I'm very much surprised that many leaders in our community seem to fail to recognize this fact and act accordingly. Uh, the school board has a responsibility to the community as a whole and not just the children in the community. The communities, communities in general, they educate their children not just for the well-being of the children themselves, but also for the well-being of the community. The community does not educate a community that does not educate their children will live in blight. So the taxpayers living on the South Side neighborhood are stakeholders in the selling of this county-owned asset, and they should be asked to participate in the meetings in regarding the sale of this asset. Uh, the South Historic Neighborhood Association only knows what has been published in the Placa Daily News. And uh, I'm not sure why. Um, uh, it, the paper did say that Jason Meyer, the CEO of uh, Synergy Billing, did speak with uh, the school board and some other community leaders. Individually. And, individually. Yes. And uh, I would kind of be curious who that might be, have been. Members of the school board? Not the school board, but I mean, it says in the paper that there are certain residents that uh, was spoken with. And. Uh, I'd just like to know who he's speaking with, because the Southside Neighborhood Association, where the Cambridge, uh, the Campbell Building is located, isn't uh, involved in that at all. So we would like to be involved, like to be in, in the loop of what's going on. So um, I got uh, through this pretty quick. I believe it's important to communicate to the, is, in fact, is, is a representative of Synergy Billing here today? Um, how, how is Synergy Billing going to be affected if the new health care system that's being debated at the moment is becomes a single-payer system? I mean, Vito, this is a... Vito, excuse me a minute. You haven't called and asked what we've been doing on this since the last time you came up and spoke against the project. And you did some time ago, didn't you? About a year ago? Yes. So, I mean, really, there's been some dialogue in the paper, but I wasn't one that met with the group, and I know some did, but shouldn't we reserve this for the I think the end I think you're allowed to ask during the presentation. And during the presentation, you'll yeah. be able to so comment, because we've got similar questions that you're going to ask. Yeah, okay, we're great. And you'll be able to stand up and ask a question. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the the synergy billing then will be coming before the board oh, with a presentation. Yes, absolutely, today. Oh, fantastic. Not presentation. That's fantastic. I, I was kind of concerned that the billing might be sold today. It could be. It could be. It could be up to the board. Well, we well I think that we should be in the loop in regards to. Well, that's what I'm saying. You, I, I haven't heard it. Is a presentation today? Uh, that's, there's coming there's before the board. Today. There's a there's a. As an offer to be yeah. considered. Great. All right. I'll be sticking around for that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's Great. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Moving on uh, to the consent agenda. I'll start with you, Ms. Cummings. Do you have anything you'd like to pull? Oh, yes. One thing I couldn't get, sorry, I couldn't get an answer ahead of time. Um, it is number E6. E6. 
six. Okay. First Mr. Buckles. I'm good. Miss Gilliard. Got mine taken care of. Okay. As Adam. did I. All right. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda minus E6. I second. second. Okay. Miss Gilliard seconds the motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And I'm I'm just confused. I'm a little upset or confused or whatever. And and um, I wasn't able to talk to Lucy Broski. But there is a pre-K. We keep pushing pre-K education over and over. How important it is to get our kids in pre-K. So Mosley was cutting a pre-K teacher, and that bothered me, especially with the lowest school in the community. Um, why we would cut a class? I know it's something to do with the SIG grant and SIG three, but I don't care if we need to bring it out of general fund. If you're going to cut a class that needs to be part of our curriculum and pre-K, I mean, I just am a hundred percent opposed because we've got the foundation pushing, um, getting money raised for adding pre-K classes, and now the lowest school in the community is cutting a pre-K class. I just don't see numbers? how that can't. They had well, the numbers they would. They care. did. No. See, I'm thinking it was they, done we, because we, we don't know. like to speak to that. But I mean, I if there was it. enough, it says there wasn't enough. I think Lucy and I knew, I feel bad for not talking to her ahead yeah, of time. Shannon, I tried to. Is Shannon uh, available? Yeah, but we're looking at her. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's something to do with the SIG 3, but I mean. If they had the numbers, I don't see it being cut. But I mean, something's not. I, I can't imagine the numbers with that big of a class. I mean that school the enrollments over 500 and plus we're asking that to be a magnet school so we're going to get more enrollment there there's no doubt this enrollment would be up so why would we not try to increase that class back to the enrollment? and and i'm sorry that i'm going to just kind of speak off the cuff but because we can't find it in the minutes for today um the grant does fund that sig3 grant does fund additional pre-k classes at that school um, and we've talked, we had to go the, last year for SIG 3 was last year. We've gone in and we have, um, they've given us two additional years that we have to negotiate what projects can continue and the amount of um, funds that can be spent. And that grant we've negotiated with the state as to what we can continue and so what is in the grant is what the state has agreed to allow us to continue with the grant fund so it really would be down to what has been approved for the grant that doesn't mean that the board can't ask for another allocation it just can't come from the grant right. and that because it didn't now the other the revision if you look at every other position it says sig four sig three so this one that's why it was kind of confusing this one didn't say sig three No, it's actually, and Lucy did give me a quick email. She said it's definitely, um, we will only have two pre-K classes. That's so we went from three classes to two classes. One was a three-year-old class that we cannot continue to fund through SIG 3. That was the, that, that is the difference. Two yeah. pre-K, right. four. Okay. One was a combination three, of the three four, and four that, that you get zero funding for. Right, exactly. So but the pre, the, is it 215 year the two 14, yeah that actually is not a deletion it's actually where it's housed it is um, a it is our teacher who supports all of the pre-k classes across the entire community mm -hmm, that's exactly who it is and it's actually housed under curriculum right. and instruction okay because this I just I'm sorry Lucy's not here she did just answer I got it like two seconds ago the grant, the grant, it is definitely, she's like, hopefully we will find the other one from pre-K funding. They are losing a position. There's only two pre-K classes. So that means 20 kids are not going to be able to be in a pre-K class at Mosley. And that is something that the board can request, but I cannot include okay, it into a grant olds. that the yeah. state will not so approve. I so want these to request are three year olds to that add are that position. position. What the grant originally was is General a three-year-old class, yes. Yeah. That I'm we get saying, no so funding you're, for you're saying you want the three-year-olds back no i'm saying to give the opportunity to have a pre-k teacher and 
if we get the enrollment grade. If Lucy has the ability to, to, what she does is she puts them on waiting lists. So if there's not enough kids. I know what she does. So my point is, if we she has a waiting list, she's only going to get 40 kids. And then she's going to have to turn the rest away. And so I'm like, no, we got to get these kids. There's an extra 20 kids that last year could have taken and whether or not they use that opportunity and pay the money and be at Mosley my only concern is we've been on such a big initiative with the foundation raising money for pre-k and we've also have such a big initiative with Mosley mm -hmm. making it a magnet so to say that we want to cut a pre-k position I'm opposed to that and I would ask the board to per please consider How about if we bring back at our next meeting bring back an out uh, allocation request and let the board act on it at the next meeting. But if the students aren't there, right? To fill but, it. but we won't yeah, know I mean, if, if Lucy doesn't have the ability to put them on. If she's putting them on a waiting list because she so knows she right, has a waiting list for Mosley. I mean, I don't know. She didn't say, but I'm saying if you on how do you know? We haven't even started well, you, the you know and, the process of well, I, my, and, and yeah, we have. If you look at, the, at it that well, way, you could take secured. you could take the salary of a teacher and give it to the foundation, and they could get the money doubled. Uh, you know theoretically and and serve more kids so it's six one half dozen the other i mean you're, you're yeah, you could do you've got that, to let yeah. the principals have some control over what they put at their school if you ask mosley what it takes to get them to an a school they may not the principal may say i really could do without the three-year-old unit i may want this so i want the instructional team to really give us a recommendation on that because the foundation is and of itself an opportunity to do more right. for kids and i've worked and spoke with mr Paget today and i'll be yeah. talking about that later. i was going to suggest we come back at the next meeting yeah, with a absolutely. recommendation I just you may want to yeah. i mean that's and after we consult with principal and rhonda right i understand that the sig three isn't going to pay for it anymore but i'm saying that if the the board can vote for general fund to play for okay. pay for a position it's really important I just okay you, you could take a teacher's salary though theoretically and if pay, we have enough four year olds for, that pay for right. Right. If right. It, not the three year old 20 right. kids no, if, if you gave it to the foundation you could serve 100 kids so. we, we will consult with miss odom and uh, come back with a recommendation at our next meeting on the 13th thank you okay. that's all i'm asking i make a motion to e approve six. item uh e6 e six. second all in favor uh, aye. aye opposed motion passes all right now we're moving on to gosh that was quick discussion I think he's fast uh, there is no unfinished business so we're going to look at new business the first item under new has been taken care of <coughs> has been taken I got a oh, yeah, okay yeah that that was uh ronnie Okay, so the next one is discussion, input, and action on designating a member and alternate to serve on the. Wait, we skipped. Jane, you got emergency. emergency. You, you got to do emergency. emergency. Where yeah, am I? It's below. Uh, this two-sided thing is. Jay. Right here. Jay. Jay. I thought you said Jane. Okay, Jay. We and need to go in well, Jay and Jane. out of regular session. Jay and Jane is very close. I know. Yeah. Into emergency session. The first item under emergency is after school an extended year hiring of teachers to tutor for the 2017-2018 school year. Justification, explanation, time sensitive. Madam Chairman, I make a motion that we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. <clears throat> the second is a stipend for to a TOSA to provide data analysis for scheduling at Interlochen High School. Justification, explanation, time sensitive. Madam Chair, I motion that we approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Aye. And the third item is revision of summer camp transportation agreement with St. John's River State College, which was approved on May 2nd, 2017. Justification, explanation, time sensitive. Madam Chair, I make a motion we approve. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And the motion passes. Now we'll do discussion. <laughs> and the first item that we'll address is the discussion, input, and action on designating a member and alternate to serve on the Florida School Board Association, <coughs> which is FSBA Legislative Committee. Who's doing it now, Kathy or David? I guess I still David, am. but I mean, are you going to those meetings? Um, Madam Chairman, 
Since I got designated, we've only picked up three or four million dollars. So no, I, don't, I, don't know. I meant, are you going to the actual when we go to Tampa and Tallahassee? I have, yes. So do you want to keep doing? I, I will do whatever you want me to do. Uh, you guys might might need to. <laughs> some of you, you may want to get some. Uh -uh. No, well, I don't. I, I just want to make sure you still wanted to do it. The only thing I would like say is that Kathy anyway. has uh, is on a, on the FSBA board where they do some of those legislative meetings, and I hate to do it, and I don't know if we could table the item and ask her, but she currently does hold a um, position position on that, so I feel like that would be the. Well, her, she's on the nominating committee. Right, but that's so she's more involved with the FSBA. I, I, my feelings would not be hurt a bit to be rotated mm -hmm. off. But Karen, I still do you would know be, when this has to be submitted? Uh, We have time in the memo so in the letter. Table it did. It, it yes, you I can make a if you choose to, to table this item. Is there a second? A second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we're going to table that until our next meeting when Kathy's here. Well, if she wants to do it, it's all well and good. I mean, the people I know are the people I know, and that's not going to make a difference anyway. I mean. Okay, you're still going to keep yeah. pushing forward for us. I know you will. Okay, and I wasn't, I just didn't know if you still wanted to do it or not was the reason I, I love doing it. Okay. It's so fun. Okay. Next is <laughs> discussion, input, and action on appointing a representative to serve on the interlocking planning board. I would nominate uh, Kathy Jorgensen. And I, that's whose name I had Can listed we do that here. here. Absolutely. <laughs> you snooze exactly. Because she Charlie? lives there. Oh. She's in we have a We have a motion and a second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Teacher, not to be here. The yeah. motion passes. Kathy Jorgensen will be our representative to serve on the Interlocking Planning Board. Um, next, budget amendments for April 2017. Uh, Shannon's coming up to the podium. We have questions. Hi, Shannon. Okay, for April 2017 in the general fund, we had a total budget increase of $70,099.40. This resulted from an $887.06 donation for the backpack program, a Johns Eastern insurance loss recovery claim in the amount of $5,454.88, a teacher of the year donation from GP for $2,000. Chromebook repair money in the amount of $3,532.46. Dory Schlossberg money for driver's education in the amount of $45,000. A U Futures grant for $1,200. And wellness collections the amount of $12,025. For school food service, there was no change in the revenue, but there was a decrease in their fund balance of $1,500,000 for remodeling projects and school food service. And currently, they have um, more than they are allowed to have by state for um, in their fund balance. They're doing a good job. Yes. They really are. They are. So for the special revenue fund, there was a total budget decrease in the amount of eleven thousand two hundred ninety-two dollars, and this was due to a budget decrease for Title One school improvement. And for the internal service funds, there was a total increase of. $258,040, and this was for rollover funds from SEEC and TIF for Gilchrist County. Any questions? Okay, okay. Thank you. I, make a, I make a motion we approve. We don't have to. Okay, we don't have to. Keep going. Okay, and then um, discussion, input, and action on the sale of the Campbell Building. Okay. We send a oh. And you want to um, recognize Mr. McMahon, Jim McMahon? Oh, I didn't know speak. who that was. He's oh, representing, <laughs> World. Jim WWE. representing the, uh, the uh, World person that's wanting to purchase Proposal. the building. Hello, board. My name is Jim McMahon. My address 1410 LPGA Boulevard, Daytona Beach. With me also is Jeanette Durr, the Vice President of Communications for Synergy Billing. I will try to field your questions and provide some information on the real estate and development side of the opportunity that's being offered. Jeanette can speak specifically to the inner workings of Synergy Billing. Okay. So with that being said, uh, I have four points to kind of cover briefly if the board will allow. Uh, some of them would be very informational 
and then I'd like to defer the financial component to the fourth and final item because that may be the more, most contentious of all. So in reading some of the information that's been put forth, there was a question raised about impact to the ball field. The response to that is zero and none. This is mainly for the building proper, does not involve the parking lot across the street. It's fenced that the board has used for some period of time. It's specifically the building and the grounds, no impacts whatsoever to the ball field. Okay. Any clarifications further for that? I'll be glad to yeah, kind of go please. step by step. I was if under you. the impression that the school board had donated that to the city of Palaka years ago anyway. Um, from what I understand, and Charlie may be able to speak better to this, that um, a woman named Ruth has been paying the property taxes. I'm, Charlie, talking, I'll about defer ball, to I'm talking about the ball field. Oh, the ball field, sir, I don't know because we were never really interested in it. We'd like to see the ball field stay. Doesn't that belong to the city of Palaka? I thought CL so. Overturf donated that. Yeah, I believe the, the ball field is owned by the city, but the, the property that we researched across the street well, was uh, Burks. fenced. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, I knew that. Uh, and and I, 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 we did not research uh, the, the owner of the ballpark, but I believe it is yeah, the city. Yeah, because that was city. the old bus compound yeah. mm -hmm. Right. when Jane was my teacher in kindergarten. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when Harry Bailey was the... Oh, yeah. All right, so if we're clear on the ball field. Second question that's come up frequently is effects to the historic character of the structure. Uh, we've met with Bob Goodwin a couple times, nothing formal, very informal and casual. And uh, Bob has a history, as you all know better than I do, of a number of years serving on the Southside Historic Board, local architect, uh, who also lives above his office. So he has a good sense of mixed use in just a few blocks away. And uh, we spot, have spoken with Bob. And I want to assure you that Jason's intent is to maintain the historic character of the building. In some discussions that we've had with different stakeholders and folks in the community, some very solid suggestions have been made. One was, why don't you consider a, having some installation art or a sculpture garden that revolves around the outside of the building to keep it more in, in some of the character, the artistic events around Palatka. Jason's double thumbs up on that, loves the idea. Likewise, inside, since the building would hopefully be very active with passers-by and, and tourists and visitors, some inside art would also be made available, or space at least for it, for any kind of display and sales. So uh, that would be there. On the outside, the only change that's being talked about internally at this point is the addition of a possible patio between the two entrances facing the parking lot. There's a little bump out there that wasn't part of the original construction. And the idea for the patio, and I'll get into that in the use, but there's a little area out there that might hold, I'm going to say, maybe 50-ish people. But again, we're deferring to Bob Goodwin for a lot of that kind of definition and specificity. So if I, I'd be glad to answer any questions about the historic character. Not intending to change the paint, not intending to put additions, a third floor on, not intending to do storage facilities at the other end of the parking lot any of those types of things. It's pretty much as is with the possible exception of the patio on the outside. The third topic I'd like to touch on is what's the actual use gonna be there? And although it's not a school board specific question because if there is a sale, the use of the building, then the jurisdiction falls to the city of Palatka. And that would involve a zoning change or a PCD, uh, plan commercial development overlay to there. However, uh, the game plan as it is now on the internal drawing board, and again, subject to input from Bob Goodwin and his professionals, would be to have up to 14 residential units there. And as designed in-house, they average six to 700 square feet apiece, which is about the size of a typical one bedroom apartment that could be owned either fee simple in a condominium format or as an actual apartment. That's still a little loose. And again, the city we're gonna go to and uh, if we make it through here, and have them weigh in on the form of ownership, although I don't know that it would be a significant difference either way, quite honestly. Now, um, with that, it would be a mixed-use facility. So that would be the residential portion, not more than 14 units. On the commercial side, there'd be four subsets. The first, an anchor tenant, would be the home for Synergy Academy, which is the training facility, training academy for white collar jobs that is involved with Jason's medical billing component. And again, for question side of that, I'm gonna to defer to Jeanette 
you know, should you raise questions on that. So that'll be the anchor tenant. Additionally, the city of Palak in discussions with the mayor and the city manager have talked that they'd like to see a business incubator happen. And Jason's, there's enough space in the building, fortunately, to allow that to happen. So as a business incubator, the phraseology refers to common use of facilities, for example, um, computers, secretarial services, um, fax machines if they need them, modems, whatever, uh, the ability to have teleconferencing, et cetera, and where small uh, startup businesses would be able to come there and test the waters without having to have a huge amount of initial capital. So it would be kind of a startup situation that could be available to the general and would be available to the general public. The third component would be some office space. Depending on, again, Bob's layout and everyone's relative needs, there'd be some office space available there, probably for smaller, single, maybe two-person type offices to go in and uh, have businesses open to the public there. That would be the third component. And the fourth was kind of a cool thing that we thought about would be to have kind of a food and beverage operation there. And it's not a nightclub, not a dance hall, um, but more of a, a food and beverage, think somewhere between Panera Bread, Starbucks, and some kind of a bistro. And we felt uh, in talking to a couple folks uh, on the South Side District, Bob being one with his history there, that that would be kind of a cool go there with your dog Sunday morning, read the paper, have a cappuccino and a, you know, whatever, pastry and that would be kind of the vibe to kind of make it fit in with the neighborhood because very much it's a transitional area it blends the very cool south side historic district of which it's a part with the downtown and so with this mixed use we hope to put that into actual play as a very neat transitional spot um, again the city will have to approve any uh, plain commercial development or PUD zoning overlay that's technically not in your uh, bailiwick However, we do acknowledge that, uh, as someone had said, it is important for both the community and the county and everyone at large, the decision that you hopefully will be making today. So those are the uses. I'd be glad to try to answer any questions up to now before I step into the financial side, should anyone have any. No? Uh, Mr. Russo, did you have any questions at this point? Okay. Sure. I've got to take a quick. Sure. Well, you can stay right there if you want to, as long as we can hear you. We need. No, sir. He, he uh, lives you come up. He needs to come to the microphone. Oh, yeah, you got to come up to the microphone. We can't hear you. Okay. So I'm reading this sign. So you guys will have to give me some guidance here oh. on responses. Okay. Okay. Yes. Be glad to respond. I well, yeah, we'll let. Him address questions to you. Yes, okay. Well, uh, Bob Goodwin does not represent Southside. He hasn't lived in the Southside for as long as I've lived in this community, 13 years. So I don't think he really is the most appropriate person to go to to represent the South Historic Neighborhood Association. So that's having said that. So that's so is that the only uh, resident that you that you have that he has spoken with that Jason uh, building uh, Synergy building has spoken with just questions. Bob Goodwin the architect being hired to do work in this building go ahead and ask all your questions and then we'll have him address them okay all right so then obviously there's a mixed-use building so it's not going to be completely dependent upon uh, Synergy building business model which is the training of uh, white collar jobs to, I guess, in the healthcare system of America, I suppose. So it's not going to be strictly dependent upon that because if it was, <coughs> that would be susceptible to the new American Healthcare Act that they are currently uh, discussing in Washington. And if they go to a single payer system, that might destroy that business model. So that would be a concern that we would have because then the, it's not a financially viable any longer. So the only other thing I'd ask is, uh, is uh, when it gets into the financial end of things, because the offer is three and, three and a quarter. We've had a previous offer at 450, making it a drug treatment center, which is an extremely bad idea for the community, because that only entrenches blight in the city, which is, we are absolutely opposed to. So I think three and a quarter is awful cheap. And I think that that's reflected in the uh, citizens writing into the Plaga Daily News. It's been in, in the letters to the editor lately. Two letters. So, 
Thank are, you. Are we to the financial part of it? Not yet. Go ahead. Comment back response? Please. Okay. Thanks for your comment, sir. Um, again, this is not meant to be adversarial whatsoever, just informational. Okay. So in answer to who else we spoke to that was familiar with the South Side, a uh, lady realtor named Roberta. I think she goes by Robbie. Robbie. We spoke at length with Robbie and told her these plans and asked for feedback and input. And quite honestly, I think she's the one that may have come up with a sculptural component for the outside. I'm not sure. I can't remember. But I think she might have. But and again, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but I think she thought this, of all the proposals that have been made to date, was the most amenable for the neighborhood and the community at large. Uh, the second one with respect to blight, I'm familiar with the terminology and the impact of it. And in order to develop a CRA, which is what the Southside Historic District is, prior to having that put forth, uh, Florida Statutes 163 is going to require that you have a blight study, which is a determination of, poor, in a, the simple words are something to the effect that it's in poor condition, underutilized, and in essence, a negative. And the intention there is by creating a CRA, which is what the Southside Historic district CRA is, and you actually have three of them, is to take and reinvest funds that come from that particular geographic area back into that area for improvement of that area. So the blight study, it's there, it was there, it's being remediated, I assume, by expenditures of the last uh, however many years that CRA has been in effect. I think it, the extension happened and there's about 24 years left on that. Uh, so those are the two comments that I would like to address. Jeanette will respond to the health care comment uh, as a synergy expert. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm sorry to say that Jason just had to be traveling and, and isn't able to attend, and I'm a poor substitute, but I will certainly do my best. Um, Synergy Billing provides medical billing revenue cycle management, so um, handling of the entire revenue cycle for federally qualified health centers. And although they are not a client, one example would be Azalea Health here in Putnam County. Our company is uh, 11 years old. We have grown from just a few employees to 116 today. We have two more starting next week, but we plan for 500 employees within the next several years. And we have had difficulty finding qualified employees to serve our clients. And we have a waiting list of clients who are asking for our help. You'll notice from the dates that our um, beginnings of our company were before the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, which was a huge change to the American health care system. We have adapted to that very well and continue to grow. Under the proposed, and I'm not sure which one is dominant right now, um, under the proposed changes to that system, um, these health centers will rely on us even more than they have in the past to capture the revenue that they can. There, those, those centers have been in, uh, in place for 50 years. They enjoy bipartisan support. Is there anyone in Putnam County of any political persuasion who, is not, who does not believe in the mission of and the good work of Azalea Health, for instance? And that is true in every community in the US. Um, so we are very confident, obviously. Jason wouldn't be making the investments that he's making in our company and the commitment, uh, the commitments we are making in this community and another I'll tell you about um, if we did not believe that we will, as we have in the past, adapt to changes to the U.S. healthcare system. I think several people here know um, that we are developing a similar, much larger project in Holly Hill, Florida. That's a little community surrounded by Daytona Beach, also uh, enjoys some economic challenges where we are redeveloping an old school property into our corporate campus and expect to have 500 employees at that site within the next several years, as I said. But in order to continue to staff the, the, um, the work that we have, the clients that we have, we have needed to reach beyond Volusia County. And that is why Jason asked Mr. McMahon to help him find um, 
a, a wonderful property such as he has found in the Campbell Building in a great community like Palatka in Putnam County where we feel we can help elevate uh, the, the we can transform the community in ways that we are planning to do and are doing in in Holly Hill so uh -huh. would you share when when you met with me I don't know about <laughs> the others when you met with me you talked about the benefits that it would have for our students that could potentially end up at Synergy. You you mentioned some things. Would you share that? We, we expect to, and the superintendent can also speak about the conversations that we've had, and also Mr. Perkins, the conversations we've had with St. John's River College. We wanted to make sure that whatever we are proposing is of benefit not only to public school students, but is in partnership with St. John's River College. And I'm happy to say that we plan to reach into the schools and help give young people a vision of a great career that they can have. Our folks, and I encourage you to go to synergybilling.com online and take a look at our company, our culture, the, um, the faces of our folks. Like us on Facebook or just follow us on Facebook and see what we're doing. We want to, as, I, as you mentioned, Ms. Gilliard, reach into the schools and start developing a vision for those young people with some training and early introduction into our program. The school, I want to emphasize, is a nonprofit, um, accredited, and um, so will will um, I think just bring tremendous benefits and and offer new opportunities it's interesting in the first presentation today we talked about manufacturing opportunities this is another set of opportunities for young people in the community they should have options and we look forward to offering those and then we hope um, for some our, our work is something that can be done remotely and so there are opportunities for folks um, to work to live here in this community and to work for synergy billing Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a couple of questions and I'll just go right to the elephant in the room <clears throat> Not besides me and that is that this building is is the market adjusted value is is a million three twelve uh, Here he comes 540 <laughs> and We've had opportunities to sell it at a little bit higher price and we didn't I, I guess I'm going to have to know more about it before I were to even come close to approving the difference in price of the replacement value of the building or much less the market adjusted value to what we're looking at would be I'd have to know several things how many full-time employees will be there how many you've got 14 units for rental type properties rental and, or condo sir or condos you've got uh, Synergy Academy that would be an office obviously where you're going to you're going to train your folks in medical billing and different things yeah, of that in, nature. Correct. How much of the facility would be taken up by the academy? Again we're looking probably as the that would represent about 40 percent of the commercial side of the structure. 40 percent? Of That's the commercial right. side yes sir. Okay that leaves you a good bit and the business incubator I guess would be all part of that or would No sir that'd be a, a separate room if you separate will. I don't know room. the last time you were actually in the structure you're probably very familiar with it. I've been in it many years. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so as, as you know the gross area is approximately 25,000 square feet. If you look at the net leasable area which would be the area excluding the corridors and fire stairs and so forth we're going to lose 25 30 percent because you remember those corridors are super wide stairs at every at every corner so the net leasable is prob um, this is Jim's guess you know it's probably 17 18 thousand square feet of net leasable space okay. um, may, may I try to respond to your question so yes, far sir. yes sir. okay so here's a piece of information that hasn't been out in the public venue at least in the last week or so it's a appraisal report for 200 South 7th Street for mr. Rocco Carbone Carbone Carbone. Carbone, yes. the attorney for Douglas and Hedstrom, um, as of May 11, 2015. Mm -hmm. Now this, uh, and it was done by a Walter Messer state certified appraiser from Palatka. That's right. Okay. So in this um, appraisal, the sum amount, and I'm going to just read the final paragraph here. I personally inspected the subject and made all the necessary investigations and analysis of the data collected in arriving at my estimate of value. In my opinion, subject market value as of May 11, 2000, 
excuse me, 2015 date of inspection is $390,000. Okay, now this appraisal I don't think has been exposed as much as some other sources of information. Oh, I remember. Yeah, I remember. Exposed, and there, there have been multiple appraisals done, and another appraisal came back over a million. Yeah, yes, sir. And from I what I understand on that uh, appraisal for the million, was that was in comparison to other markets. If that structure had been in Jacksonville, maybe even Daytona, Orlando, uh, St. Augustine, based on a per square footage price, that certainly would be a million or more. I, no I, disagreement. I, I agree in part with what you're saying. Uh -huh. The problem I see is this is a this is more of an opportunity uh, t for us to have some dialogue. Do do we want to go ahead and 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 you know look at at your your bid and maybe say you know we're gonna we, we need you to come back or we're gonna we're gonna ask x amount of dollars and see if we can find some some way to uh, creatively work this out and and maybe come up with more money or when you look at something that takes a replacement value of two million or it's valued on on this property appraiser's sheet at a million there are ways that you can you can form some type of parent resource center or early learning center and you could house a foundation over there you can use that as a as a as a matching fund to to pull in a million dollars and and I spoke this morning with our grant writer there there are, it's, it's hard it's a headache it's the middle of you know everybody's got to get kids back in school and this this comes back at a time that nobody really wants to you know to know i mean we've got an electric bill that exceeds probably twenty thousand dollars a year we've got casualty insurance on the building we've got you know some obviously upkeep and costs yes, yes sir uh and then looking at the tax rolls if you go by what the selling price is times the millage rate then you're you're really not putting anything on the tax rolls of any value uh when i was school superintendent back when dinosaurs walked the earth miss crawford hates to hear me say that we put about as much money in bringing that up to the historical district standards on the outside exterior yes. of that building than you're even offering. So it's yes, close. Yes, I'm aware it of that. It's right, I'm right aware about that. that size. So yeah. and, really, and the, really the, the, just under the two acres of land, it, I mean, me personally, I'd rather see it not going to be a ball field if you're going to give it away, but that's just how I'm feeling about it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not speaking for the rest of the board. I'm just telling you, these flow through my mind, and I would have to – hear more about how many you know you talked about holly hill and i know it's easier to put 200 employees in a building in holly hill and and yes, that sir. would be certainly something that would get my uh, mind going when you figure 200 salaried positions but i don't think we're talking about that in this building we're not i, I think that would be a correct assumption sir but and you think at some point that would be a correct assumption no, 200 employees at this location? No, sir. There, there wouldn't be the physical space for it. No, but I know Holly Hill. Yeah, How many is the estimated? I can't remember. As, as far as the actual job numbers, again, that's fluid. Um, but training. But yeah, we, Jason's expecting about 20 students per class. Question is, what's the demand going to be on the on how many classes right. will actually go there? And again, the service side of, of the proposal would involve whatever staff really wants to see whether it's less kids with a more complete education, whether it's a broad introductory level, kind of it's, it's like a uh, upperclassman versus just a freshman. You know, you do the seminar in there. But if I might, I'd like to respond to the board members' comments on the dollars. Yes, yeah, Respond fine. to that, if I, mean, if I can, may, Nikki. You can that twist okay? it either way. The yeah. Chairman try there. yeah. No. Okay, ahead. well, you know, kind of an Elvis dancer. We'll give it a try. Yeah. So well, at 300, at 390,000, and, and again, we're not to presume that in the last two years that the property has been for sale. That, and then there's probably some different board members or different leadership. And if the property is going to be used, tore down or repurposed by the school board, for the school board, then it probably isn't fair to the rest of the population in general that looks at things and invests time, whether it be brokers or buyers or representatives right. or even the board members themselves. If that's the pleasure of the board, certainly it's within your purview to do that exactly that and that may be the course you so choose and if it is at this point it is um, however when we look at the price per square foot and if you're going off the appraised sheet sir it is square yeah foot. I understand 
let me put forth this observation. Again, I can't speak for the mind of the property appraiser, not my specialty whatsoever. But I can tell you that in 2017 thus far, two buildings I know of personally on St. John's have been sold that I was involved with. One of them sold for $8 a square foot and needs a lot of work. One of them with a tenant in place sold for about $11 a square foot. So when we do price comparisons, and there's some properties right now listed, uh, one is around $20 a square foot. Now when these properties, I'm looking at fair market real value conditions. I don't know how much effort, and I don't mean to disrespect the property appraiser whatsoever, because it's always been moot. For the last hundred years history of thereabouts of the building, it's never been on the public tax rolls. It's just a number. It's a placeholder. It's a filler. It nets zero dollars and there's negative cash flow. The other thing that a property appraiser may want to do, and again this is probably above my pay grade, is that if they were to appraise it at a much lesser number and, uh, or excuse me, to assess it at a much lesser number and it was to be compared, used as a comparable value on all the other properties, then sir, I think you would find that the entire tax base of the city of Palatka would diminish by 50 percent or more. Probably. So, no, again, no disrespect to the intentions of the property appraiser, but those numbers are really moot. Yeah, but we have to explain it to our absolutely, constituents and absolutely, our, you and do, parents sir. of our students. And, and that's why I'm trying to provide you with comp, current comp sales for St. John's Avenue. I understand. And uh, also, which again, some with rental income. And I also would like to point out that because this building is even addressed in the uh, appraisal of Mr. Messer, the question is, is it functionally obsolescent? The response is yes. There's a lot of ceilings in there. The layouts just isn't conducive to much of anything. It's rather, again, white elephant-ish, and the number of buyers are probably not very many simply because it hasn't sold in two years. It's going to have to be bitten off one bite at a time like eating the elephant. Eating the elephant. Okay. So consequently, you know, the numbers, it's just not a functionally viable structure as is. To convert it into a functionally viable structure is going to take, I'm sure, more than the purchase price. Maybe a couple times more than the purchase <coughs> price. Then what you're going to find, I believe, is that there'll be a new assessed value and it'll be up maybe closer to what they've got on paper. Again, without having plans and cost estimates, I mean, I could give you means, books, guess, you know, but that's again those numbers have no meaning I, I get it I, I get what you're saying but yes sir uh, it's, I don't know how the rest of the board feels I'm just saying how I feel it's and, and I tried to it is and a, I tried it to address is a, those. it's a it's like gee we want these folks you know over here preparing our young people for jobs and young parents and to, to do medical billing and things like that and yes sir. We want it kept you know kept in good shape for the community but at the same time it, uh, there may be better avenues for us if that's all the money, you know, if you can't find a way to creatively come up with more cash. To me, that, that's just that's just me, whether it's a donation to the foundation, that, well, I, you know, whatever, I don't know. That's up to Mr. David, Douglas to have. And I agree with you. Um, so the offer is around $325,000, yes, correct? But only 162500 cash money. As of this point in time, the offer that's in, in front of you so, is, is 162.5. And I'd just like to point out to you also at this time that from what we understand, and, and Rick may be able to speak with the definition to this, is that any funds that you receive from the sale of this building has to be repurposed not into the general budget of the board, but into a facilities or buildings budget. Yeah, right. So, and, and, and Madam Chairman, part of the reason Part of the reason that the offer was structured the way it was was in response to some of the needs that were voiced on some one, in some one-on-one -on -one meetings. For example, the reason, one of the reasons that the apartments were brought forth was that if the board hires a new teacher, it's hard to find appropriate, convenient housing for them. I have a place. One of them. Okay. Um, there's also some comments about um, having a facility that was compatible to the neighborhood. So, and then there was a question about how can we make the dollar stretch, which I, I, I believe is a uh, gentleman's position, is how do we get more than a dollar's worth of bang out of it? If we're not gonna get enough dollars, how do we get more than bang? And that was where the idea of the in-kind training and exchange moved forward. 
and was thought that, hey, we can get a $2 worth of training, instruction, and value for, you know, a building that's costing us money. And so that's why it was a blended proposal. Right. That was I in response to local input. I love your ideas. I love it. I, I think it's a wonderful idea. I just don't think there's enough cash money involved, and that's just my opinion. I know Ms. Cummings has some questions she would like to ask and some comments that she would like to make. I guess I just from the perspective of what's in the best interest of our community and if you do look at the cash money I agree with you but if we're looking for it as an educational opportunity for our students which a lot of it would be for the scholarships and given our communities um, some type of employment opportunities I, I guess it's the only game in town we haven't had anybody knocking down our doors in the last three years to buy this building we had one that wanted to make some great apartments and was kind of the south historic district didn't seem supportive and he went away so we don't have any other offers board so it's costing us about forty five thousand dollars i think a month maybe it's ridiculous there's a lot of money involved i guess it's a what lot is that? we is have that, that mr bowen has that figure sorry it's, it's I, almost thirty thousand a year and sorry a year. but any, yeah, yeah a every difference <laughs> no a year I, i'm sorry i was had a lot of numbers in my head Thirty thousand a year i guess my point is if there was if we had some other people that had some great ideas and um they all have ideas you know, but down. exactly and i mean anybody that's going to invest in this has got to know the renovations involved with it so if we just said oh we want to donate it to somebody if they don't have the money up front then it's going to sit there as an abandoned building even longer than it's already been so i mean if you look at it from a perspective of offering something positive to, to the community i mean I, I can't look at the cash value of it i have to look at it as um something that's going to increase things in our i mean make a better opportunity for students that our students would have these scholarships. That was my, I really thought, okay, if we wanna do this, we need to be able to offer them something different that the kids that aren't cut out to go to a four year university, but we can offer these scholarships to students that we to wanna there. succeed. Exactly, so yeah, that was one thing. Now I would say maybe want. if we wanna increase anything, let's let's increase that amount, you yeah. know, let's With increase. With the possibility of being yeah, employed. let's increase right. the scholarship amount and let's increase the the apartment amount or something that's going to benefit our students and benefit our community i'd like to ask john chastain a question sref you might not be up on that right now but i think you're pretty close uh state requirements for educational facilities <clears throat> could could we house students in there if we wanted to make it a solution center or no. something like that there's no way we can house students in there no. but they can they, they Okay. Right, that's the what, we cannot. what would have to be done for us to put students in there? We'd have to sprinkle the building. We've got to have sprinkle. fresh air units coming in. Just a lot of, it would be expensive. There's a lot. And I, I, there's a lot of things to the, next, the next SREF question I have would be, um, if you, can I, could a charter school come in and take that building and it not meet SREF standards? Yes, because they don't have to go by SREF standards. Okay, that's that pretty well. I, I think Charles. I think he's right on that. So I'm pretty sure he is. But again, it, I just I think that anybody that has this opportunity, we've had a lot. This has not just gone on the market 20 days ago. We we've had it on. I mean, it's been sitting. I don't disagree for with you. Years. I just why don't would like those people price. not come up before now and? make an offer well it's either it's either I we're agree. gonna have to I find some to way too. to utilize it for ourselves in in some manner shape form or fashion or we're gonna or we're gonna we, can, I, we I can't just, we can't put students there yeah well, what i'm saying is you could we could at least ask for a, a better a better offer you know well yeah we could counter i'm okay with that but yeah the um I'd like to point out that at the 325 number, we're about 80% of appraisal. Yeah. Is, is So again, again, it's not like we're attempting to be 
bottom feeders or anything along that right. line. So I, I want to protect the interest you, of You of made the your proposer. offer based upon the 390 appraisal. Based on the 390 appraisal, again, which further specifies that the building's functionally obsolescent has been on the market for two years. I, I get all of that. Yes, sir. Yeah. So I just want to go on record with the 80% number. And then the other thing I want to add to uh, Ms. Cummings' point of view is that the training programs, I share her opinion on the ability to expand the educational opportunities to a segment that you don't have. And when we met with Joe Pickens um, and some of staff, there's, there was a little void in this kind of white collar opportunity. There's you know some nursing programs available. There's some welding programs, you know, and so forth. Some some blue collar job guys like me, blue collar guys. Okay, but there wasn't a lot where you get up into the white collar. And I'm going to verify with Jeanette, but I think the average wage for synergy is around thirty nine thousand a year. Wow, it's thirty six thousand a year, but we will have. Around uh, half of our jobs are paid 40000 or more. Okay, so. So, so those are for just people, people that, that you've trained. They don't have to have a bachelor's degree. Ma'am, you have to have, have a high school diploma. Degree. High yeah. school diploma. Right out That's of high school. school. That's, That's awesome. awesome. And, and in discussions with, with the superintendent. In discussions with the superintendent, and again, I'm going to defer to Jeanette here, but I just want to make this, this point. In discussions with the superintendent, uh, Jason talked about reaching in as, as early as the eighth grade, and I think that was Mr. Bowling's comment as well, too. He thought, get them early, and I heard something earlier this evening on one of the other board meetings about uh, getting into the elementary school level to talk about production skills, or, sorry, I don't remember exactly, but something along those lines. You get in early, and that's why, again, the offer was formulated with that huge educational component uh, uh, that was put in there and blended in. So I'm going to... Let Jet, uh, well, and Jeanette also, speak. as Jim mentioned, to give you the flexibility, uh, because if we just paid cash for it, it could only go back into facilities. Now you have a, a curriculum academic component to that. Um, these, uh, one of the other sort of interesting things about our program, even billing and coding programs at some institutions um, take years because they're only part time. Ours is a full-time program that takes nine months, nine months, and um, that's, that's and good. then offers. Uh, you know, it's it's a path to a good career. Every single one, almost every single one of the managers or supervisors who works for Synergy Billing today started out as basically kind of an intern. Jason trained our first employees all personally, and. Um, we never underestimate how much he knows about medical billing. <laughs> you got great, um, great feedback on you guys. I mean, really, I was just no going to say, that. Jason was very, very motivated, you, impressive, yes, yes. enthusiastic, and he is really passionate about this. We are. We we love what we do. It's a mission. Our clients have a mission. We have a mission. We will train the people in this program to work on federally qualified health center billing. But they will also, which is a little special, but they will learn medical billing and coding that they can use for any health care organization. They don't have to come to work for us. And we have even heard that there is some need, some of the providers in this community could use some help. So Jason's already imagining setting up some individuals in that incubator with their own businesses. I mean, there. Yeah, it sounds exciting. I, I I hope that we do have an opportunity to work together. The three of us have fallen in love with Palaka. We've fallen in love with the uh, Campbell Building, and those of you with whom we've met and worked over the last several months have just been so welcoming and so uh, they love this community. All of you all love this community so much. It's hard not to share your passion. So I I hope we do get to work together. Okay. I had one one more question yeah, for John real quick, and then I'm sure we got. Okay. Yeah, we got a SREF to do a district-owned charter school. Do SREFs or a district-run charter school will SREF standards allow them to be in there? You don't know that, do you? Those are just some little questions I just have floating in my mind. Those are just little questions. Miss Gilliard, did you have anything you wanted? To no. Know? Okay. Mr. Russo and, and then I our realtor. For, for, for Jeanette, primarily. Um, so have you interest, well, how does the, the potential of becoming a single payer system, how does that affect your business model? 
in regards to the training and the employee you know, the employees that you're going to have. We don't want to be adversary. adversary. I, I think the. Uh, the first thing I would say is we are so far from having a single payer right. model right this second at the, the current temperature today, and this is also one of the things I follow on behalf of Synergy Billing and in our, uh, in our industry, is that we are fracturing to more power to payers, not less. And um, so we are pretty far from that. Uh, and I expect to be, I guess, for the next eight years. Um, there is no congressional taste for a single-payer system. They are reverting even, they want to cut back on Medicaid. So again, um, you know, I question the premise and, and just, I'm pretty well informed about that on a day-to-day -day basis. Could happen, but as I said, we adapted to ACA and will adapt to whatever other changes come in. And I did want to say that part of my concern that I've talked to the attorney is that if something does go wrong and Synergy doesn't succeed, I mean, we still will get our money in in-kind donations. There will be something in the contract where that money would still be secure. And So we're not going to get all the money up front? Is that what you're conveying? It's an in-kind scholarships and room and board. So we're only going to, the community is only going to get 162000 cash and then the rest of it's going to be in trade I think, I think that was part of what we wanted well do you have anybody else offering money y'all y'all yes. don't you get will adversarial this sooner, has to or be later. sooner or later you will have two it. years i Where's mean 162 for a for a 1.3 million appraised building i mean do you take that seriously Peter, the last time uh, we're, we're trying to work this and resolve it we don't want any adversarial relationship and i'm trying to Get I'm not too, opposed to last their... Last time you were here, we talked, I think you talked about pitchforks and right. fires and <laughs> stuff, you know. Well, nothing that has been brought before the board has made y'all happy. Nothing. Well, wait, wait, wait. But the only you two, don't the have only, any wait, plans wait, wait. to pay the only for two, by the building. The only two issues that came before our community for the use of that building was both of them was detrimental to the community as a whole. Now this, now this, this, this yeah. proposal, we are not necessarily against this proposal. Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. Bruce, but, so, but for 162, I am. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I believe you've been heard on this matter. Well, yeah, for start, we can move on. I, just Thank give you. me just 30 seconds. And that is well, in uh, Sarasota, there's a, there's a uh, Mediterranean, there is a Mediterranean Revival Architectural Building in Sarasota, and it is had 90 years, it's as old as the Campbell Building. Now, this building is a Southside Elementary School, and uh, the principal there is Steve Dragon. And Steve Dragon, quote, we're proud of that being a part of a 90-year tradition of great neighborhood schools. The, the revitaliz revitalization of effect of to the city, not just the south side, but to the city as a whole, if the Campbell Building became the jewel of Putnam County School District by having it a charter school or a magnet school. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's But you just uh, heard him, we can't put kids in it. Thank you, Mr. Well, how Russo, can they do for it your in Sarasota and not in pl and not Pilate. Well, maybe their building wasn't in the shape ours is in. Thank you, Mr. Russo. Thank you. I believe you wanted to hear from. I, from I Mr. do Galloway, want to say fair. yes, Mr. G okay. I do want to say in response, I can assure you that that building will continue to be a jewel of the South Side. Thank you, Mr. Galloway. Thank y'all so much for allowing us to um, be here. Um, we're now going to get into a little bit of reality check. When y'all hired us. Um, on the RFP, I believe it went out in October, and we officially went in in January. Um, there was a time that we felt like y'all needed some money, and if y'all recall, we gave y'all an absorption rate to tell you exactly how long it would take to sell this property somewhere between six hundred and nine hundred ninety-five thousand dollars And if you recall, the reason y'all gave us two years to try to sell this property we said at 995000 on the best day, it would probably take us two years. Uh, we had used a, a building somewhere where our absorption rate was three years, and we were two years and seven months from hitting it. So our models are pretty accurate. Um, I, I think we were aware back then that somebody might come in and offer you a, a 350 or 450 <coughs> offer. So what I'm going to tell you is um, what, what I can show you since we've been aggressively marking the property. And I believe in these numbers because our computer overlays, we pay a lot of money for these overlays. If you believe in technology the way we all should be 
some of us my age, we don't like to believe it, but it's here for real. And we can track hits. We've had on that property 14,703 search results since sometime about the middle of January to, to today around 12 o'clock. Out of those 14,700 hits, and we're not having somebody hit, you know, these are, I can show you a map from every state within the, within the United States, where they come from. Out of that, we only had 292 views. What is surprising, you would, you would hope that out of 292 views, you would have more showings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our showings, our pure prospects, have been six. A total of six. Maybe seven <laughs> with, with y'all. There, there might be one or two that maybe somebody else had come by to look at it and, and knew the process to go in. Those were what we call six or seven pure prospects. And out of our staff, and there's four of us here, we've only had three showings to date. So that kind of tells you what is something worth is what somebody's willing to pay for. Um, we have leased probably close to 50 or 60,000 square feet of medical billing. Uh, let me explain to you how I feel from a professional standpoint, a medical billing. It doesn't matter if we have a Republican controlled House or Senate or President or a Republican controlled House or Senate. If you believe in technology, that end of the business, either through medical billing or coding, is being co-sourced out because those professionals can do something better than doing billing. We are proud to have in our community four medical billing and coding companies. I would be extremely proud to have Jason and his company into this company. He's a young man with a lot of energy. Um, medical billing and coding is here to, to last. And the, probably the most important thing is, he's a young man with a young wife with four young fam family members, five now, excuse me, <laughs> five young kids. Now, I don't own anything in this company, so I'm not here to promote this company. I'm just saying you have an unbelievable community activist who will bring jobs, has brought jobs to Daytona Beach. He is in the process now of taking a, a junior high school that sat empty for probably six, seven years, and has turned into what I want to call a Google-style campus for a better term than that. There'll be something similar to this. And, and a very similar situation in a neighborhood where a lot of people, it, it was just not going anywhere. So you have a bird in hand. As far as how you negotiate the price and stuff, that's, that's up to y'all. What I'm just telling you is the reason you hired our company and the reason that price was set like that, we said maybe you could get that price. But at the same time, you remember we talked about you've had offers at 350 that couldn't come along. And so we'll, we'll set that price up. But for us to get that price, it would be a two or three year process. So what y'all really need to do is make a decision is if you want, uh, somebody mentioned it, somebody who'll give back to the community, um, somebody who'll give an opportunity to, to give better than um, frying fries at Wendy's mm -hmm. for the young people who, and, and quality jobs, good jobs, and a career path. I would strongly ask that you look at this. Realize as a realtor, I want you to get the highest price. But the reality is, is when you have 14,700 hits and only 293 open it, and you've only had six or seven pure prospects and only three or four pure showings, what do you have to sell? And, and I, love, I love old buildings and stuff, but when you start opening walls up, I can tell you right thing, what any contractor gives you the price to do renovation, you can double or triple it. So there's a cost factor. Um, I'll be more than glad to sit down with y'all individually and go over prices or creative ways. But just remember this, that building has been for sale long before our company came Bye. here in January. So um, if you have any questions, I'll be more, more to uh, answer them. Um, but, but it's a it's a decision that I believe it, it, you look at return on investment to your community. 
why it's assessed at that, I've never been able to figure it out why it is assessed at 1.1 million. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank Mr. You. Galloway, Thank you. so much. I suppose I was the last one to deed a school to someone, and it was the old Johnson School to the county. It was probably valued at 600000 to a million. I don't know. It was a big piece of property, and the county has it fixed up for Head Start and all the stuff out there in the West End. So that's been a while ago. But. The county hasn't even expressed any interest, have they? Huh? No. no, no interest from the county. So, I mean, that's... Is there anything that you guys are going after for grants that is contingent upon this? Do you have any um, of these restoration grants from the city that you say, well, if we don't get the grant, we may have to change our plan? What we, what we do intend to do is because it's in the CRA, we do intend to go see about using 50% of the CRA money that we put forth, 50% over the time of the lifetime of the CRA. So we will ask for that, but that's the only concession we're asking for. And that's for renovation. You still don't yeah, have that any, money would any come in. response, John. I um, I really do wish there were more money involved, but I, the other part excites me so much: the opportunities for that's jobs, me. the opportunities for training, the opportunities for our students to, you know, somehow incorporate oh, something, you know, with our high school students. Um, you know, all that's very exciting to me. Yes, ma'am. And, and I, again, I want you to keep in mind, although it's not of a pure direct benefit to the board, to the school district, that there will be, again, substantial capital dollars put into the renovation. I mean, we all, you said it really well. You know, there'll be, you open the wall and oops, there it is. So when you start putting in residential units and you start putting up fire separation areas, there was talk about sprinklers as a, as a major cost. Well, depending if it's cut vertically or horizontally and if you've got fire code issues to deal with floor penetrations with residential above commercial, it's a whole new world. You have fire doors serving an elevator, panic hardware, and the list, as you say, just goes on. So I, I want you to, to please, uh, as you, sounds like you're preparing to make a decision, keep in mind that from a capital improvement point of view, the purchase is most likely going to be far the lesser of the total capital investment that Jason's making in the community and for that that being said I think it's I think it makes sense to me or we wouldn't have brought it forth he, he's got two other properties in in Putnam Jason does no sir I, I own those other two properties okay and I also have some in uh, Crescent okay. City and I Jim can I ask you a question Good. yes sir I, I'm looking at your um, proposal for the the in kind yes sir and you, you put a time limit of five years of us using that in kind or yes, sir. or we forfeit it what are you basing the five years on my concern is there's going to be some time in getting if the the five years is from a uh, certificate of occupancy rick is that is that answer your question yeah i'm just i'm just reading that um if if we don't use that or use up all those funds by that time we lose them all as yeah, far as basically what I did, and this is, this is Jim's putting it forth, okay? So my int underlying int intent there was to take the amount of dollars, set a minimum and a maximum that could be used so that you would have to use up some every year. And then at the end of the five years, either the, either the total amount is gone or uh, from the minimum perspective. So the clock starts when, when the oc occupancy takes place? When the, when the certificate of occupancy is issued and the business license, so we're available to offer those services. Gotcha. Okay. The only change to that I could maybe imagine, Rick, is if you wanted Jason or his team to do some uh, outsour not outsourcing, where you do it remote, where they come into the school, to your schools. If you wanted Jason to come hold some classes in the actual, your existing schools, then we wouldn't need the access to the building so that could happen sooner and I think at some point I'd like to see some more specifics as far as you know what what does uh how much does a scholarship per student a absolutely, cost absolutely. break it down how and, much and do, are the rent I mean how much does 62.5 get you is that yeah no all those and that's a great question mm -hmm. all of those costs would be basically set out to the public in other words when we go to advertise the units if they rent for 650 bucks a month that'll all be public knowledge and of course you'd be getting it at 650 a month mm -hmm. um, in in terms of the scholarships uh, what I was hoping it was that if the board votes in favor of moving this forward 
that the uh, yourself and council staff would be able to flesh this out in, con in connection with Jason himself so that you'll be able to better identify how you want what and what's the per unit cost, which is I think your question is the actual per unit cost. Right. And Jason, in our discussions, has been completely open and amenable to whatever format you want to take it. Again, do you want to just have a fairly few number of students with full scholarships, or would you rather have that broad-based or some of each? And that's why we left it uh, in the typing there, in the proposal, very ambiguous, because you're going to make that, that call. I understand. Um, yes, ma'am. Students who attend your um, school or your training are they eligible for FAF for FAFSA with financial aid yes ma'am effective the, what's the final authorization date for the um, grants the, the, the accreditation oh, date. I'm sorry, January 12, I mean, July 28th July 28th it's already been approved but the the clock ticks till July 28th and then yes it'll be fully um, Florida <coughs> Department of Education was it? It's the Council of uh, the uh, Commission on Independent Education. We'll have our accreditation finalized on July mean. 28th, and that'll make. Okay, I'm not sure you know what I mean. Do you, like they, everyone who attends a post-secondary institution um, has to apply for what's called uh, FAFSA, Federal right. Application for Student A, mm -hmm. and that tells them how much they qualify for as far as a Pell Grant or any kind of aid is concerned and how much they will be responsible for paying for themselves. Is your institution one of the institutions that qualifies their students to get financial aid? I'm not sure of the answer to that, but I'll have it Could for you tomorrow. Could you find tomorrow. that out? Okay, thank you. I guess my and so after the five years in our, in our contract and the agreement, after that, our students that say this is flourishing they want to continue they would working. still be that they would we pay want to make sure right for tuition we want to make sure that they would be eligible for financial aid and i understand that and i'll have that answer for you tomorrow we're also looking uh, we're, we're getting our state sort of accreditation as i said in july and shortly after that we'll be getting our national certification i think a national accreditation i think that will that, that's the one that i think yeah. you need um, i think it's federal yeah. uh, mm -hmm. by the time we're open we'll have answers to that or do what we need to I, do i guess charlie i'd like to know since we really don't I mean we're not you're gonna have the the money up front to go back into capital outlay dollars and we really that's not where we really need it per se I mean we can always use it could it be could it be restructured in a way where that money went to the foundation to pay pre-k or if a superintendent may want to restructure it somehow and and then that money could be I'm just asking you that because they can double that money. I, I just, maybe not. I'll certainly take a look at it, and if it's a possibility. I mean, the board I, may I not want to. I'm certainly that. not. I mean, there's too many options for me to look at, but it, it is certainly something that I, it seems like people are tired of handling, and I guess I spent too many years in that building, so I knew it quite well. Uh, we'll make a little yeah. I, I, I feel pretty comfortable, sir, in saying that as, as long as it's a legal, I know the board wouldn't do anything that, that isn't. If the, if the offer needed to be restructured and relabeled well, for you a, to receive additional benefit, I'm sure Jason would not have a problem Well, it would be that. a benefit to you guys as well. It would be a donation to a sure, foundation. Sure. And, and that way you could, you could structure it differently, but I'm still not, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions that I'm not going to get answered. And... You know, it'll be up to the board here, I guess, today, whether they want to postpone this or table it or, or they want to go ahead and take action. So one question, um, it says on the contract that the parties and property TBD newly formed specific purpose Florida entity. Correct. So we're not entering an agreement with Synergy? No, what you're entering into an agreement with would be a newly formed LLC based in Florida. Jason will be the, the lead person, very likely the only person in that LLC. The, that would be the contract. The contract would not be assignable unless it's to a related entity. Okay. Why and wouldn't we sign with Synergy? Well, Synergy, it'll be a tenant in the building, but Synergy's mandate in its business model is to provide revenue cycle optimization for fairly qualified health centers is its primary mission. It's not in the real estate business per se. So for it to own apartments and so forth, 
it, it oh, doesn't fit. For that to it reason. to be a landlord, it doesn't fit. What about uh, Synergy? What we're doing with the Fountainhead. Synergy billing is not developing the Fountainhead in Holly Hill. Yeah, and this would actually be the Fountainhead in Palaka. There's a Synergy TBD. Billing Academy that's already in existence. Well, oh. what, is there a Synergy Billing Academy that's already in existence? I think Jason has already filed that name and it has been working under that with Career Source. Okay, would that be the entity that would most likely enter into the contract? No, sir. It, it would actually be a, a newly formed LLC that would be based single purpose for the Campbell building here. Okay. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a start and I hear a willingness to continue the conversation and work toward a, a reasonable solution, uh, but there's a lot of work that has to be done still to iron out the details and of course the devil's in the details we received thank you very much for putting forth the proposal um we received that last week so i think there's been probably been like three business days to have passed since Agreed. we received that proposal and a lot has to be fleshed out we're starting with a half page of bullet points and it's probably gonna end up probably around 20 pages um a, a lot's got to go into figuring out what all of those uh, bullet points will entail but I'm certainly committed to working as fast as we can if, if that's the will of the board to continue on this path. It will take a, a lot of time to work with Synergy and hammer it all out. But we want to make sure that the district is protected. So in the unfortunate and low probability event that it doesn't work out with Synergy, that there's some type of uh, recourse for the district and sure, we're certainly. not left absolutely back. certainly well we and talked it, about like at one time like some deed deed restrictions yeah absolutely on the on the deed restrictions rick would we uh, were specifically in place for the residential component there were some serious concerns brought forth about uh, subsidized housing or right. something along those lines you know charlie would prepare whatever deed restriction language makes sense and it's a no-brainer it's in right. there yeah, um, with respect to the the overall contract components Charlie, that you're referring to, um, couldn't agree more. What we did is provided a, a skeleton that you could either, we can flesh out together. Um, my concern is I'd like to do it expediently. Uh, so it, you know, what I would like to, to see action. happen as an action item, not that I'm in a position to, to state, but if I could request an action item that, that would come forth from the board, it would be basically an endorsement uh, by vote, a motion for endorsement with instructions that staff and council flesh out this contract to come back before the commission before the board for hopefully final approval final formal approval that would be my hope on a takeaway for today an endorsement of the contract to be reviewed is that how we would is that what something uh, along uh, those proceeding lines? forward with this proceeding. prospective purchaser they've got to put time in it to flesh it all out right yeah it's basically kind of a we want to start going start dating right. that's really what it amounts to and then we get this together then we go steady and then we get married when you guys uh, <laughs> give us the okay then we've got to go through this with the city for their zoning as we well so please keep in mind that it's a one two thing <laughs> two steps um so the only things that i would really love to see a little bit increased or changed would be um the credits of five years and maybe the amount of the scholarship credits because that's not going to go very far the hundred thousand when I think mm -hmm. it's 15,000 per student. So I'd like to see that. And the other thing that really concerned me is rental credits and the amount of 62.5 used what in five that? years. So let's say this apartment rents we, for- We based it on Nikki, two year, two compartments you would need. Oh, two? We, yeah, two apartments. Oh, I was thinking one. Okay, oh, that no, makes no, 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 okay. no. So, sorry, again- Because I was the thinking bullet, how could that- Yeah, yeah. no, that's silly. Okay. The, so it's so the, so it's that's the, the, you guys would basically receive a gift certificate. And you can use the gift certificate, but we don't want to so have you take all 12 yeah. apartments, for example, where we wouldn't have cash flow. Well, we have so that. we're thinking it was based on two apartments for as long as you need them. You and you don't have to pay 100%. You could say, listen, I want to subsidize $500 a month of the rent and let the new teacher pay 200 for example. Right. That kind of a deal as part of your hiring incentive. So it was, it was something that there's a lean of the only thing that I was concerned about making a new newly formed LLC is that if something did happen, you couldn't make those attack. apartments and those scholarships that, Let me, that uh, in count donation. And if this LLC goes bankrupt, great, right. great question. Let me point to the last 
uh, item, I think We'd it's in it there, back. where it says there's a, a bank letter, a diminishing bank letter of credit for the sum of the above items. Right, right. So what that means is you would have, in essence, a irrevocable letter of credit from a theoretically local bank, oh. although it may be Volusia County. So okay. the 162.5 cash cash is front end money, capital dollars, checked to, you, to the board. They're 162.5 in in-kind exchange, assuming we're using those two numbers and you don't want to put more into scholarships, then that money would be guaranteed by a letter of credit from the bank to the school district. Okay. So if there, if the there was a default or deficiency, you'd trot down to the bank and say, here's my demand, I want this amount of money. Now it would diminish every year. So if you used 30,000 one year, it'd go to 132 for the renewal. Right. So no, it's absolutely an irrevocable letter of credit from the bank. That's why I, that's why I, I mentioned it, it, you might could restructure it to donation to the foundation so more money could come in and possibly. Possibly. Ms. Dewar, are, are the current students in the academy yeah. they're paying fifteen thousand dollars for the, the nine month program? No, that we can't accept those students until after we receive our accreditation. What we have right now, we develop this curriculum for our own employees because can't get this thing short enough. Um, we, de we developed this curriculum for our own employees. As I said, we had a difficult time finding people who were qualified, developed our own curriculum. Career Source, of Volusia Flagler, asked us to develop a four month program for people who had no background in healthcare and were long term under and, long -term under and unemployed. Yeah. That proved to be so successful. We're doing that again right this very minute. We have 15 students in that program and with a government grant of, uh, you know, probably for the four-month program, about half what would be our curriculum cost, our, our cost, and we haven't determined that yet. Um, with their encouragement and the encouragement of some education experts, we've, we are now completing our curriculum and have applied for accreditation of that curriculum for this nine month program. And we will start that in the Daytona Beach area this fall. But we, we can't accept any students until we're accredited, of course. Can't even advertise for them. So we're pretty excited. And we'll keep you posted on how that's going, but we're very excited. This has been incremental. We've learned so much in 11 years about what it takes to turn out a really, we call them our elite professionals. And uh, Jason, some of you have heard him talk passionately about how these folks are not clerical workers. They're elite detectives. They're answering the questions in very high technology, as Gigi mentioned. Um, and that's one of the advantages. We have one of our differentiators in the market. So, And where is the one that's up and running already? In Holly Hill. So there is a possibility that we could drive down and Yes, I'd welcome that. They'll be there for the next uh, four months. <laughs> okay, sounds like you're driving, Miss Gilliard. A road <laughs> trip. I'll take you all to lunch, though, when you come down there so you can see. There's a nice little restaurant in the. So we, we do, it's an area called the Market in Holly Hill, and we have a class of 15 there right now. I'd love to and see And then that. we could see it. Yeah, sure. It happens. Okay. One um, last thing closing. <laughs> Are we you closing? Are you going to pay Sorry. the closing costs? I didn't see this anywhere. Typically, we just use a standard far bar contract, and those are already determined mm -hmm. in the standard. I know. Far bar. What is far bar? Negotiable. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, sir. They, you're absolutely right. They are negotiable. Her daddy's a lawyer. She can't help us. <laughs> Listen, I think Charlie's got your back pretty well over there. <laughs> okay. So, I would like to make a motion to endorse the. I don't know how to word it. I'm sorry. Um, approve moving forward with the negotiation of the prospective purchaser and uh, instructing to the board, board attorney and the administration to continue negotiating and developing a more finalized uh, contract and proposal, and this is a long motion, but uh, Sherry, <laughs> just say yeah. 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 try and get yeah. it in the next yeah. ASAP, however you want and, to word it, uh, <laughs> with expeditious speed. There we go. Does she have to Sharon. repeat that? Uh, she, can, read. she can do that. No, I'll give you the short version. Okay. To move forward with the potential buyer to 
um, come up with a contract for the selling of the Campbell Building exponentially quickly. Expeditiously. Expeditiously, no. Expeditiously quickly. No yeah, spell it. Is that good? Second. Sounds good. Is that okay? <laughs> you got to say it louder than that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Nay. Opposed? In good conscience, I cannot want to go nay. But that's, okay. I don't have a problem with what you guys do. But you have that right. I have that right. Yes, that's right. Motion passes. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to talking soon. Real soon. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Closing costs, that's you. Oh, James Talk got to Charlie. Charlie. James got to close. Closing costs, that's no, him. That important. We're not. Hey, I've been here. Have we got we another meeting? Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Back go. to the agenda. Board member reports. I'll start with Mr. Buckles. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> He's ready to go. Uh, you know, well, I've, you know, it's it's been a long day, and we've covered a lot of ground, and I, I just, I just, we've done everything from talk about charter schools to to uh, divesting property to uh, you know we've got to go into a closed session in a little bit, so I think it's in the best interest for me to just if I have questions I'll address them to the superintendent and or you guys individually All right, good, good. okay you can't talk to us I'm good <laughs> who's next Nikki quit rambling huh I would like to say that it is <clears throat> exciting to think about a new opportunity if we look from a perspective of offering educational opportunities for our students then this would be a great move for us to partner with Synergy, which that's really what it is, a partnership to me is for a community. I know we're not making big bucks on it, but at this point it's we're losing money. So I want to get out of the negative and into the positive and a positive impact on the community. Um, as far as the charter school, I think there's a lot of discussion, and I just want to say that I'm definitely wanting them to succeed in that small school environment but I think when I counted there's 34 days till school starts mm -hmm. and so I can't imagine asking the board to just say okay we're gonna take over a charter I Why? mean there's great ideas and great things and I want it to happen for the students and the opportunities but they're le logistically I just don't Bad think timing. in 34 days we would be able to put a plan together and do these students any justice I just don't feel that it's I mean, I'm hoping that next year that, I mean, I hope that they'll continue to get the enrollment up and um, we can have that discussion, but it's a planning process. And I just, anything that's just kind of done really quickly isn't usually mm -hmm. really. Well, we're going to be available just to give them options if they choose to go another route. Yeah. I mean, I just, I want as far as having people there from our schools and if teachers decide they want to find employment elsewhere, we want to give them that opportunity. Yeah, so I feel timing's like everything yeah timing and i feel like if we could support as much as we can to get their enrollment to where it's feasible for them to stay open i just would hate for these kids to have a transition that they're not really ready for or want so um, i just want to make that comment that mm -hmm. just take some time but i think we can do what's in the best interest of the students miss mm -hmm. gilliard i just want to uh, talk briefly about courtney carter's program she has going on at miller oh middle school um kelly smith and she has one out at our interlocking elementary i got an opportunity to share with the students at crescent city at on a tuesday and thursday i went from interlocking elementary to to kelly smith and at while i was at um interlocking elementary one of the students did ask are you the one changed that school time <laughs> and so i and I was pleased that he asked the question and I told, and he said, well, why did you do it? And I gave him, you know, the gist of what we're doing. So I, I appreciated that, that they are aware and what they're doing for those kids. So they are to be commended that, that we are extending opportunities for them to get better so that when the school year comes around in the fall, they will be better, hopefully better uh, prepared to, to excel in the mm -hmm. classrooms. It's just so much going on and we have so many uh, irons in the fire, but everyone that we put in the fire with is with the hopes or the intention 
of bettering, making better opportunities for our students, for, for potential uh, adults that would want to stay in Putnam County, that will be able to support a family and live here. When I look at stores constantly closing, every time I go into J.C. Penney's, it breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. Kmart is already gone, and I think they mentioned that as a possible place. We can't just keep doing things the way we've always done them because mm -hmm. we are losing. And so if this program can bring jobs, can become, uh, I've forgotten, a jewel, whatever term they use for our community, then we need to do something to stop the bleeding. And I see that we have programs in place that provide opportunities. Uh, the Collegiate High School, we have the Cambridge, we have the great programs that Renee has in place. And so uh, Rome wasn't built in a day, but by George, we, we're making a great effort to, to make things happen. Uh, David is snoring, so I'm about no, to close out. I was laughing. When you said by George, I got tickled. <laughs> but anyway. It's like you were announcing Thank a football you, game. Thank you, Ms. Gilliard. She's, get, she's getting doing her football. By yeah. George, it's a touchdown. <laughs> oh, to Sam Graham. Um, I would just like to say, you know, I'm very concerned about the students at the charter school. They're the ones that get to me and speak to my heart. Um, I want them to have a place to go that yes. they feel comfortable and um, I hope that EDGE can come up with a solution to stay open. But I'm like Nikki, I don't think, you know, finding out how many days, 60 days, 30, 30, 30 34 more. days before school starts, we don't have time to come up with a plan to, to open a, you know, take over a charter school or a magnet school. We just don't. I mean, there's just, we've got so much other stuff to be accomplished in 30 days. Uh, but I wish them the best of luck. I think, I think they're doing a, a good job for the kids that are there. The Campbell Building, wow. I have such mixed emotions about it. Um, that building, I mean, there's nobody here that it means more to. I spent six years of my life in it and grew up across the street from it. I played in that red clay every, practically every day of my childhood. That building means a lot to me, but it's sitting there deteriorating. Um, and nobody else has come to us with a viable offer. Do I wish they were giving us more money? I certainly do. But I'm so excited about the, the uh, prospect of having jobs, um, scholarships for our students, training, you know, um, the apartments, the little coffee shop, if that comes to, to fruition. Um, you know, it's, it's just such a hard decision because I know that building is worth more. Sentimentally, I, mean, <coughs> I got my first kiss in the cloakroom in my third grade <laughs> class. So that's Jeez. very sentimental to me. But anyway, oh, tell us more. <laughs> I will. Well, we'll have them to engrave that over the door, over that area. <laughs> but anyway, um, that'll be the just sweet. Just hope spot. we can get all the the kinks ironed out. Yes. Mr. Douglas, we'll work very quickly to try to turn this around mm -hmm. as soon as possible. I know time is of the essence for them and for the board. Uh, with you moving forward, so we'll uh, make contact with them immediately and and try to have something in a near final form uh, by the next meeting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I just want to say um, recent legislation, I know you saw on the news House Bill 7069, very comprehensive bill the governor signed this past week. And um, so our staff is, is going to be reviewing that um, in detail, possibly report back to you the things that are on the front burner. But number one thing I want to point out actually deals with what we're doing today, the Campbell Building. Uh, one, one part of that legislation addresses schools of hope. And in that legislation, it says October 1st, we have to publish all of our surplus property and outside hope operators who could be people from out of state could actually come in and move into our building and we have to like it. Well, that so, would have happened. That yeah. Would, that would so happen. I'm saying hmm. well, your decision is time sensitive and, you know, we could have somebody move in there and possibly take funds out of our county to somewhere else. 
So we, we definitely want to do what's right. So I, I appreciate you being bold in doing that. And I appreciate you being bold in our, we are talking about our CTE programs. You know, you have chosen to fund two additional allocations to support our initiative for the industrial manufacturing. So that, I appreciate you doing that. And uh, I'll tell you, it's a start, it's an investment in our young people, and it's because you guys are willing to step out there and do that. So thank you. I uh, want to point out tonight is our first parent meeting at 7 o'clock. Hopefully we'll be ready by that time. And then uh, Thursday night in, in, on the west end and next Monday night in the south. Just to explain to parents about our new starting times, we should have principals sitting up here answering questions. So, And also I want to tell you I missed you at the FADS uh, Florida School Board Association training. I went to that this past week. and. A lot of good stuff going on and legislative update, and I'll fill you in on all that stuff later. All right. That's all Thank I you. have. Thank you. So we're going to reconvene in just a minute, right? A few minutes? Yes.